two presentations tonight. Um, the first one is Resolution 2020-25, Recognition of Former Mayor Nick Jerome. Unfortunately, Nick was not able to be here tonight. He had something come up. Um, so we are going to go ahead and uh, read the proclamation. And then following this one, I believe Ms. Tillett is here. Yes! And Mr. Ma Vice Mayor Massey will be reading Ms. Tillett's to thank her. So with that, and we have a lot of whereases here, y'all. Whereas, Nick Jerome served as the citizens of Mount Dora as mayor from November 2015 through November 2019. And he served as city council member at large from November 12th through November, um, I mean, I'm sorry, November 2012 through November 2014. And whereas, Nick Jerome served Mount Dora for a total of three non-consecutive terms and has served the city faithfully, taken an active role in the accomplishments of various strategic priorities set by the council. And whereas, Nick Jerome has participated in numerous community events and has contributed to the city by establishing consistent office hours with an open door to all citizens of Mount Dor. And whereas, Nick Jerome proudly served in the United States Armed Forces as a veteran and is a veteran who has gone the extra mile to recognize and accommodate veterans by designating a Purple Heart parking space, championing for a new flagpole and cleanup of the beautiful monument which stands at the corner of Baker Street and Fifth. And whereas the current city council recognizes the valuable contributions made by former mayor and city council member Nick Jerome to the city as a whole under the leadership of a city council on which Nick Jerome served for a total of six years. And whereas during former mayor Nick Jerome's tenure, the citizens of Mount Dora have benefited from numerous projects and accomplishments, beginning with significant updates to the strategic plan, bringing five goals to life which include economic development, infrastructure, fiscal sustainability, growth management, and public safety. Some of those include the Wakaiba Parkway project, the hiring of an arborist to conduct a full inventory of trees throughout the city of Mount Dora, engagement of the Redevelopment Association, Redevelopment Associates, LLC, to administer the Grandview Business District marketing analysis, oversight of a pilot shuttle program and downtown parking initiatives where at least 50 additional parking spaces were made available to patrons, and economic development division for the city of Mount Dora, which included entering into a contract with Levy Cons Con Consulting and the hiring of an economic development director for the city in order to continue moving forward with the Wolf Branch Innovation District as well as other economic development initiatives. Now, therefore, I, Kathy Hoax, Mayor of the City of Mount Dora, and on behalf of the City Council of the City of Mount Dora, do hereby issue resolution number 2020-25, expressing a deep appreciation for the dedicated services and contributions Mr. Nicholas Strone has made through his service on the City Council. On behalf of the citizens of Mount Dora, I hereby extend heartfelt gratitude and best wishes for continuing success and happiness in the future and it will be signed by all the council members and it will be placed in an appropriate framing and given to him um, in, the in the near future. And with that, Ms. Tellett, would you come forward? Sure. Vice Mayor Massey. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. We got a seat right there. <laughs> We're addressing resolution 2020-26. Uh, and I'll begin with the whereases. Whereas, is, whereas Laurie Tillett has served the citizens of Mount Dora as District 1 City Council Member, initially elected in November 2015 and serving through November 2019. And whereas, Laurie Tillett served Mount Dora citizens for a total of two consecutive terms, and she has served the city faithfully, taking an active role in the accomplishment of various strategic priorities set by the City Council. And whereas, Lori Tillett has participated in numerous community events and has contributed to the city by making herself available, herself available to the citizens of Mount Dora. And whereas, Lori Tillett proudly served in the United States Armed Forces and is a veteran who has been an avid supporter in participation in efforts to recognize and accommodate veterans in the city of Mount Dora. And whereas, the current city council recognizes the valuable contributions made by former council member Lori Tillett to the city as a whole under the leadership of the city council on which she served for a total of four years, and whereas, during former council member Tillett's tenure, the citizens of Mount Dora have benefited from numerous projects and accomplishments, beginning with significant updates to the strategic plan, 
bringing five goals to life, which include economic development, infrastructure, fiscal sustainability, growth management, and public safety. Some of those include the Waikiba Parkway project, the hiring of an arborist to conduct a full inventory of trees throughout the city of Mount Dora, engagement of Redevelopment Associates, LLC, to administer the Grandview Business District market analysis, and oversight of a pilot shuttle program and downtown parking initiatives where at least 50 additional parking spaces were made available to patrons, and economic development division for the city of Mount Dora, which included entering into a contract with the Levy Construct consulting and the hiring of an economic development manager for the city in order to continue moving forward in the Wolf Branch Innovation District as well as other economic development initiatives. Now therefore, I, Kathy Host, Mayor of the City of Mount Dora, on behalf of City Council and the City of Mount Dora, do hereby is issue resolution number 2020-26 expressing a deep appreciation for the dedicated service and contributions of Mrs. Lori Tillett made through her service on the City Council. On behalf of the citizens of Mount Dora, I extend heartfelt gratitude and best wishes for continued success and happiness in the future. I met Mayor and Council Members. Um, I think um, Miss Amy Jewell would just like to come up and I don't know that he's here, but introduce, um, just give the name and the position um, that we've recently filled um, because we've talked about it with the board and this is a good time to talk about our new, excuse me, new, new hire. Good evening. Hello. Uh, we have recently hired Robert Austin, who prefers to go by Bob, which helps us all out. We've got a few Roberts around here. So um, he's been hired as the horticulturist to oversee the CRA and downtown district. Um, he comes with, uh, to us with a lot of, of experience, and I would have liked to have brought him here tonight, but it's actually my fault. I've neglected to invite him, so we will bring him back to the next meeting and give you an idea of um, introduce you to him. But um, he does plan to lead a downtown beautification committee with the involvement, I believe, of a Parks and Rec Advisory Board member, a CRA Advisory Board member, and then some other appointees. And we hope to address some of the concerns of some of the non-native Florida plants that are in the downtown area and have somebody with the expertise to actually decide what to plant down there. So. And I thought, uh, Mayor, as we've spoken and as some of you have even mentioned to me, um, having these other members of the boards, of the boards that are affected by the downtown is important um, and establishing um, from your perspective the, the board as you wish to do it from that point. So um, I'm going to, one never assumes, I'm going to um, assume that um, next meeting perhaps we can look at appointing some people to it then um, we'll go through the process because there'll be some public um, appointments and then we'll have the each of the different groups appoint somebody from their group um, so it would be parks and rec uh, northeast cra and um the cra all right and uh, both cra's and um and then had one more um typically then this Bob would be one of them that Bob. would be for. Uh, typically on these type of boards, you would appoint someone, and, and then the someone. council as a whole would present someone, so that gives you the six, and then um, we can add um, someone else if you've decided, or we have other staff members also that would qualify in okay. that, um, unless there's another board that I'm not thinking of. We kind of talked about arts board, maybe being one of the person, a person from the oh, arts board or historical, yeah. okay. so if you choose another board, that's something you can let us know tonight, okay. or we can kind of bring everything back to you. Would you all like to think on it in the next meeting? Because um, I know we've got some people who have talked to different ones of us that are very interested in being part of this. Does it need to be someone from a board or it can be just someone? Well, part, some of the positions will not be on a board, but part of the concept we were thinking was trying to t tie the advisory groups into it so they know what this group. Sure. This would be a time-limited group. Um, and we'd sunset it. We'd need to decide um, six months or a year. Probably, I'm, I'm going to say a year would probably be appropriate. Like but it, but it's maybe. it's um, like right. But we thought by doing it that way, we could we could make sure there's um, constant communication and tie-in with other existing groups who do overlap and work on some of these different things. Um, but now that we have the Gator that we're working on getting it so we know we'll have watering capabilities we have the ability to start looking at what can we do and, and there's people in the audience that i'm aware of that are very interested so i want it and i actually asked them to come tonight so they can know that we want to talk about this and get this moving forward if you all are comfortable makes right. good sense to me 
I would suggest each of you send to me if there's someone that you as a, as a council member would like to appoint that's not active on another board. And then we'll reach out to each of the other boards this month, um, February, as much as we can, and ask for a representative uh, from those boards. And uh, uh, again, try to fill the board with seven members as our past uh, experience, and then bring that back to you probably at the February, at the March 4th meeting. Okay. Is that good for everyone? Okay. Very good. Thanks, Amy. And we'll look forward to meeting the gentleman next month then. Okay. Um, public comment. Um, Mr. Bozeman. Plan to build plan to build pickleball courts. Yes, hi, my name is Edward Bozeman. <coughs> I understand that. Uh, go ahead and pull the mic up there so it can be recorded. There you go. Yes, I understand it. Uh, and did you give us your address? I'm sorry. 1827 Cherry Lane. Okay, there you go. Now I understand that uh, in December there was a preliminary preliminary plan brought forth that included a 25,000 square foot rec center on the old public work site over the by Unser, by the middle school. And then less than a month later, there's talk about putting in 18 to 24 pickleball courts. And I would like to know, what is the plan for the pickleball courts? I mean, is this something that's going to generate revenue? Because in June of 2018, there was a pickleball tournament here in Mount Dora, and it brought 22 people. Meanwhile, we have kids in that area, in that community, and residents that have been asking for a community center for 10 years. Now, I would just like to know, what have we as a city budgeted for our youth? Not for the tourists, not for the merchants, but what have we budgeted for the youth over the past 10 years? And what do we have budgeted moving forward? And, you know, no disrespect to any former members of the council or mayor, but in the reading of all of the goals and accomplishments, not one mentioned youth focus any focus on our youth at all. So I believe that putting in the pickleball courts, I, I want to know what the goal is. What is, what is going to happen? How, how is that going to benefit our community? Okay. First, let me just say, there have been no decisions made. What, we, what I understood we are doing, and then Ms. Hayes and also Ms. Stewart is here, is we were gathering information of a number of options that there and you've listed that plus there's several other things that have been in the works talking about one of them is attainable housing so when that large site became available when we took down um, the public works building and this is just my thoughts everyone else up here may have different ones I was concerned that everybody was going to look and say oh I want that I want that and my comment and what I brought here to the council was we need to step back and look at all the things and figure out how the pieces fit, to, pieces fit together and then how are they all going to be move forward because each one of them has different funding mechanisms and they're, they're at different places in the budget plan. All right. Okay. Because so I just believe that a center where the kids can go for after school activities where they can be tutored because right now we're looking at oh, our reading and math is far below the state average. You know, our math proficiency 44%, the state average is 57%. Reading and language, 42%. State average is 54%. And people have told me, well, what about the parents? Well, in that community, in, in our community, they may not have both parents involved. And if they are, then the parents are working. Kids get off at school at 2 or 3 o'clock, depending on whether it's the middle school, which is right there next to the property, or the high school, which is four blocks away. They can easily walk there so we don't have to worry about transportation. And they can have something focused on providing for our kids and providing for our future, not just looking at the short-sighted term of how can we make a little money with a pickleball tournament or with something like that. But let's look further down the road for our kids. Well, and I think that's what I'm trying to communicate to you, is no decision has been made, but there are these different components out there that are being looked at, and nothing has come here for formal presentation to say here, this is what you need to look at and prove. As far as I'm concerned, we're still gathering data, but I'll let Ms. Um, Hayes talk and trying to pull together the different pieces. We have a comprehensive rec plan that said these things needed to be. We have our strategic plan that we're looking at saying that we need to focus this way, so we need to pull it all together. And we're actually right now are waiting for our next session for the strategic plan. And, and your point is well taken that there isn't specifically spoken to it about the youth in the strategic plan specifically that I can recall. It's more in a generic um, 
way I look at it, broader sense. But it is a very much a concern to a number of us here who attend a lot of the meetings and know what's going on. But with that, I'll shut up and let Ms. Hayes talk. Well, and to your point, um, again, um, we have to look at the Parks and Rec plan, and that's the next phase of the March 6th, and then we drill down from there to talk about the youth. Um, that's, so there's goals, then there's objectives, and then there's initiatives. And we didn't get through that whole process. So what you may have saw was just us taking the, on the website, I'm assuming, it's going from the five goal, the initial goals to three goals. And then we just kind of threw out things that fit in those that were still live, so to speak, items and things we need to look at. Um, so I do believe the March 6th will really bring to, to life some of the other things that we need to look at. Um, the other piece that I would bring up is that in the budget, if you looked in the budget, you did see 500000 if I recall correctly, for a recreation center or a center to use for the youth. Um, that's been in the budget. We've carried it forward. Um, we've also, um, Amy Jewell, our leisure services uh, director who spoke a moment ago, has had several conversations in the public. Again, this is a public conversation that needs to take place. We've met at the Northeast Board. Um, we have to go back to them. Um, the, um, if we put a, a rec center in the northeast community, we need to listen to them where it needs to be, not where we believe it needs to be on Highland and Fit in, in um, uh, Lincoln, if that's the place. So that may not be the location that they would prefer to have the facility. So there needs to be some discussion. We focused at the last meeting about what the neighborhood that we put a project in, whether it's a community building project or pickleball courts, we need to bring the neighborhood in and make sure they're on agreement. And that's what I heard from this council last time is it has to be a neighborhood agreement um, that th these are the services they wish to have and not a a, a vision from the, the, the staff members as to what we think we should develop and put there. So again, Holly Lott, a good example. Um, Leisure Services is spending a lot of time in the neighborhood. Um, they'll be out there this Saturday during the UCAN event um, to focus on what the neighborhood expects to see out of Holly Lott. How do they wish to use that, that, that particular um, park? That was a discussion at this table from council, very clear direction. Make sure the community tells us what they want to see in a park, not what we believe they want to see. So we're taking it from that approach, and that's the direction I've been given. There is money there. Um, we do believe there's additional money in the Northeast if we need to tap into that. But until there's a clear vision of what the, for the particular Northeast needs, or what the regular city needs, or maybe another community, we need to go to each of those communities and actually see the needs of the community. We even have areas that we need parks um, that we don't have any. So we're trying to address property in which we can purchase to put even a green space park or a regular park. So we don't have parks in the District 4 area. So we are looking at all that, and it has been a, uh, an item that every week we continue to look at, but we don't always have an update for that. Okay. okay? Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Roy Hughes, Rec Center. Welcome. Nice to be back. Um, Roy Hughes, uh, 30225 Tokara Terrace. Um, I want to echo from uh, what Mitch was saying in regards to what we've advocated for many years. Uh, many of you have been behind the scenes working for Parks and Rec and the kids. I, I think that that's uh, uh, something that is talked about, but I've had people come to me and ask me to speak on their behalf in regards to the land value that that has over there, because that isn't a recreation area. Um, it is zoned, I believe, for recreation, um, and that's why we put all of the pools and the ball fields and the disc golf and everything else there. The centerpiece would be the rec center, and I've had the privilege of working in Parks Rec 45 years before I retired. And I can tell you that 15 of those years I ran rec centers in Virginia Beach, and I know the value of what it means to the community. It is outdated to believe that you can serve the public in the buildings that you have over there right now at the Martin Luther King. It needs to expand, it needs to grow, and you need to have a place where everybody can go to do that. Senior center, after school program, a gym that we can use for our activities and sports, you can actually put a pickleball right inside on the courts there during the daytime and people come use it when it's not in use or in the evenings. But the value of a rec center. And so when I think and I have people come to me and ask, my opinion is, open your minds to this. We've got a generation of kids that when I started here in 2008, that have grown up and now have their own kids and they have nowhere to go. We need to start that dialogue now, and that's what I was asked to do. And I uh, thank you for your time, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank, thank you, Roy. Thank you, Roy. 
Pastor Bartell. Can't read. There you are. I'm sorry, I couldn't read the last little bit. Coleman. Coleman. Oh. Coleman is the name. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to the Honorable Mayor, uh, to the Council, uh, the Chief of Bell, uh, everyone in your respective places. Um, I've been a, a local pastor here for the last 22 years, serving at the St. Mary's Baptist Church. Uh, I don't want to bring a resume with me, but uh, also been with the uh, <clears throat> Mount Doral uh, Police Department as a public safety chaplain volunteer for the last 12 years. Um, <clears throat> adopted two children out of the neighborhood since we've been here. They're grown now. We got them through high school and uh, the Lord blessed us to be able to, you know, reach out and do that. Uh, at one time I had five boys in my house at one time, and they all ate like men. And they kept me broke and humble. But uh, I'm here tonight with deep concern for the uh, park and rec funding uh, in the northeast section. Uh, parks and recreation is one thing. But I believe with all my heart that when people change, places change. And um, of course, we're, we're all about uh, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe in the power of God. I believe that God has the power to do anything he wants, anytime he wants, however he wants. And so we're, we're concerned about souls in the community. Uh, along with that, we are here not knowing how the money is to be allocated in the northeast section, uh, the, the government grant funding. Uh, I don't know if it all has to go towards parks and recs. I'm not sure about that. But uh, we have a dire need at this time for a transportation vehicle on Sunday morning to pick children up in the community, to try to get them to church and to try to be concerned about the families. You know, we have a lot of single family parents in that area. We've got a lot of young ladies that are trying to raise kids on their own. And so we've been partnering with them and trying to make a difference in their lives and in the lives of the children whenever we can. Uh, and uh, we just come this afternoon to pray that the uh, city council would consider uh, partnering with us as a church that's been in the community for 130 years. Uh, so it's a, it's a historical landmark, the St. Mary's Baptist Church. And uh, like I said, we've been there, I've been there for 22 years as senior pastor. Uh, we've, uh, we've, we've adopted kids out of the neighborhood, and we've done a lot of volunteering, and, and we're still there serving with all of our heart and with good intent at all times, uh, but mainly concerned for souls. Because I do believe, once again, uh, parks and recs, you know, by basketball courts and public restrooms and swing sets, that's one thing that, that really caters to the physical needs. But when we talk about spiritual values and integrity, and I believe that when people change, places change. And I believe that we are doing all that we can to strategically make a big difference in the Northeast section when it comes to souls and lives in the community. So I do pray for your consideration. Uh, maybe at some time we can sit down and chat about our need and about what we are doing here in the community. Thank you. And, and yes, um, I have had different people come, and I'm sure perhaps other council members have, talking about the need for some form of transportation, not just for church, but the fact that we have different programs around town that the children get, can't get to, such as summer camp and um, art camp and things. So it is on my list um, of things, and I'm sure we as a group will be talking about it, uh, because the the... the the thing that I have observed, and I've lived here about 35 years, and I've been active in the town for 25, is the community is very involved now. Not that they haven't been in the past, but we've got a number of groups going on and are sharing with us their thoughts. And that's, as, as Ms. Hayes said, we want to know it's what the community wants mm -hmm. and that we're not pushing something on you. And the same thing exists beyond what you just shared as to where to place things so that it is something that will be used for all of them for all of the members of the community, exactly. not just a section of the community. Right, and we did have a summer feeding program yes. at one time yes. for the entire community where we had uh, lunches for kids that were latchkey yes. kids, 
So that band that would be used for that also? Yes, absolutely. There's a Best number of that. components that need to be there. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much Thank for taking you. the time. All right. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, that's all the cards I have. Does anyone else wish to speak on anything that's not on the agenda tonight? See. Seeing no one, I'm going to move on to approval of the agenda and council. Anybody need any changes? I have a motion for approval of the agenda? Sure. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, we have our consent agenda, which has the minutes on it. Motion to approve. A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, let's go to resolution number 2019-193. Ms. Stephan? Resolution number 2019-193, a resolution of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, relating to the purchase of two fleet vehicles from Bozard Ford Government Fleet and three feet fleet vehicles from Allen J. Fleet Sales, providing for legislative findings and intent providing for purchase authorization, providing for the implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for Scrivener's errors, providing for complex, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Um, I know that Vince can come up and speak for, for the Fund 123, which is the protective services, so I'll let him come on up. Um, I would also um, just mention that um, this is a very special fund. It's a special revenue fund. Um, there are restrictions here set by the state as well as by the city and by the government in the sense of, of um, the restrictions by which a building uh, fund has to work within. Um, the purchase of the trucks was in the budget. We did present that this past year as a budget, budget line item. You'll notice in the budget we did have to make an adjustment of uh, some 13000 because, again, it was an estimate not having the numbers in at that point in time. Um, but I would also say that um, and Tom could speak to this if you had questions. Based on this past year's uh, state statute requirements, um, the funds in this account, um, the fund balance that can be carried forward from year to year has a restriction on it. Um, spending the funds out of this account for these vehicles helps, helps us on that audit line item, so to speak, uh, because we're, we are still carrying forward monies less than what is restricted by us purchasing the vehicles. Um, again, I know he can speak to that if you have questions, but I'll let Vince speak to the purchase, and if you happen to have any questions from that point, we'll be glad to address. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Uh, that, that is a great summary of the presentation. This was discussed in the budget uh, season. The protective services, our billing department, they have four vehicles. Uh, some of the smaller escapes where we're having trouble uh, maneuvering a ladder in it and things like that. And they're lease vehicles. Uh, so we're going through the lease of these four vehicles and it's now cost benefit uh, now that we're growing with additional vehicle. Uh, so we're asking for five vehicles and the summary for a total of 130,000 and uh, 13174 and 14 cents is the request with the budget transfer as well. Uh, we looked at this last year with our growth opportunities with the new vehicles and this will help our inspectors. Uh, so this is in that line, and these are purchases. These won't be leases, which oh. will be more beneficial. As a okay, so but a point of clarification then. Four lease vehicles are going away, and we're buying four to move forward. Is buying that correct? Five. No, no, I'm, yeah. let me finish. Okay, yes, ma'am. Four lease vehicles are going away, and we're purchasing four to replace those. And then we're purchasing a fifth one because the department has grown, and you need more vehicles to be able to go, for the staff to go out and... Uh, do the work that they do as far as inspections and things. Is that correct? So, yes. Um, let me say it this way. So, the, the lease vehicles were all put together as a composite, as a group for the city in total. So, we are getting ready to turn in vehicles um, and, and turn over those vehicles because we get a buyback for some other vehicles. So, we'll take these and the ones that were 12 month leases that we actually went through and process two years ago will all be turned over and, and reprocessed and some of the 36 months will be continued. Some of these were a combination, I think Tom can mention, were 12 and 36 
month. They're, they're, they're all on the 60 months, so they, they're, okay. they're, we have to keep them. But so we'll, to other departments. we'll move them to other departments and then get rid of the 36 and the 12 months. That was the presentation of the way they submitted the uh, lease program a while back. But this department will no longer be responsible for those five. Okay, but what I'm trying to understand, because one of the comments I get from citizens all the time is all the vehicles we have everywhere, and that the vehicles are newer than what they themselves drive. And so I'm trying to understand how many truly additional vehicles are we going to have that we still retain. So if I'm hearing that explanation, then we're going to have these four still staying, because they've got a 60-month lease, and yet we're going to go ahead and buy four more, and then are there vehicles going out from somewhere else that are going to be gone? Yes, because we have some that we also need to um, uh, we need to put to auction. Uh, we have some that are sitting out there that aren't being used, so we have to go through the whole fleet at this point in time and revamp the whole fleet and turn some of them in. So yes, we do have to turn in vehicles. And Mayor, to help that, because of the protective service fundings and for the availability right, of that the revenue, it made, it made sense to pick from that a line item and move the course of the vehicles down the line. So that's why that was first up for uh, vehicle purchase. That's why this came in front of you right off the shoot here this year. And I, I believe, it, if I'm not mistaken, Mayor, three years ago, three to four years ago, um, when they looked at the lease program, actually it was four years ago in 2016, um, when when I came on board, those lease programs were prepared to come on, or, or cars were prepared to come on board to replace like 90 percent of the vehicles that we had in the city so we still had a few out there that needed to be removed that were being driven but very few but there were some out there um since then again we've looked at re kind of moving those through uh, because some of them are not needed as far as the vehicle so we are looking at revamping every department has looked at uh, the vehicles needed and we'll be pushing some out and we'll be changing some or really i guess the best way of looking at it is trade in some of the leases that are not the correct leases to a better lease. Again, future going to cash buys. Sounds like a moving component here. It is. And, and what I'm trying to intellectually understand is at any point are we going to get to where we only have one more than we actually have today? Oh, I think we'll actually have less than what we have today. Okay. Council? <laughs> It seems like fiscally wise to do that if you have to look at all of the lease packages as a component and pick those that are about ready to go. For, we need to save some money because we get some payback for it and then purchase the other ones. That seems to be make some sense to me. I'm not going to second guess wisdom that's smarter than me. So, I, I think it, we can add, Tom, I think it was a savings of 26000 a year, if I remember correctly, with the changing. Of the vehicles, do I recall that? Tom Clinker, interim finance director. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. The, the vehicles that are in protective inspections today are on 60 month leases. Those do not go away. The only ones that will go away, they're all GMC, they're 23 GMC Sierras. I believe that they will, um, they're on 12 month leases. So every 12 months you have to renew that lease. GMC gives a very lucrative um, stipend for, for buying those vehicles so that when it comes to the end of the term, it's very attractive to sell those back because there, there may be some benefit to be had by the city from selling those vehicles back. And that's what we'll do is sell back, and that's the reason we'll have less. But we will take these vehicles, rotate them to the departments that the other GMCs will be coming from. The, to, to answer sort of the little plastic game with the 16 squares and mm -hmm. 15 blacks, there are four vehicles that are currently being leased that will be available to be transferred to another department. I believe they're all four states. Is that right, Vince? There's a Nissan Ford. Okay. Uh, so there's three, three escapes and one Nissan? Uh, one Explorer. And one Explorer. So two, two escapes, one Explorer, one Nissan. So those are available to transfer someplace else because they're on 60-month leases and we can't terminate those leases. That I understand, but then the department you're transferring to them to, are those going to be new vehicles that they've not had a vehicle before, or are they then replacing an existing vehicle that they have so that one of those vehicles go out of the system? I, I think to Ms. Hayes's point that there, there were still vehicles when we went through this process, and we went through this process well, before I was here, but with both Enterprise as well as with Bancorp for the police and fire vehicles, 
uh, some time back, and there's there's another uh, 29 vehicles on Bancorp, so there's there's 68, 78 vehicles total that are on lease purchase. So ultimately, the ones that are in 60 months won't be on lease purchase anymore, so we'll own those. And the four, so right now what we're talking, sorry, I talk with my hands, I'm half attack. So um, do I, so you're right. Um, so um, um, there, there are, there are, these four vehicles are on 60 month leases that, that are going to be replaced with the five vehicles for the people that need them. So those four vehicles will be available to go somewhere to another department that may need that type of vehicle because we're, they're still on the 60 month lease. We're using this mechanism because we need to spend the money out of that protective inspections fund per statutory law and we felt that this was probably a good start on your program of doing replacements and trying to figure out where do we go from here. So, yes, to your point, so the GMCs, the 12-month ones, we have to turn those in. We'll receive a stipend for those that, uh, for the ones that we identify, those uh, dollars will go back into the fund and those will not be repurchased, so to speak. So we'll move those on. Um, we'll have these 60 months that so will roll into their place. And any other place, we still had old vehicles. We still had... 12 to 15, I'm trying to remember the exact number, um, older vehicles that we didn't replace the first time. So we've evaluated any of those that need vehicles. Again, there may not be a need, and if there's not, then we, we, we don't even worry about that. We keep the older vehicles and run them. So the goal is to reduce those, how many GMCs? Uh, 26. So it's not just to reduce the, the four initially, but even some of these 26. Please do. Um, just to clarify what maybe what Tom just said or what Ms. Hayes just said, the 12 month vehicles that we have to turn back in, we don't have an option to buy those. Are we talking about the trucks that say City Mount Dora and have? Yes. So, isn't it in our best interest to buy them if we can now that we've put all the money into lettering and everything else? And Again, so the, the, the stipend they offer us or what they offer us is a very good price because they can turn those vehicles back over and resell them at a better price um, because of what they gave us on the, on the lease program. So, again, if we already have five vehicles or four vehicles that we need to use, why would I not turn four of those in? again, and use a 60-month lease vehicle that I already had in place. So um, we'll evaluate each of those. We've begun that with, with uh, Enterprise. We've started looking at all those 20, uh, 24 vehicles. Some of, t some of the departments need a truck. Some departments could actually use something less than that. But in the future, we're going to buy now. We're going to buy, and we just need to present, um, uh, you know, once we get everything from Enterprise, which we've asked for everything from them as far as the scale, so that um, a schedule, so to speak, I guess is a better way of looking at it, of what's what, then we'll have it all at the same purchase and lease, and you'll see that the leases roll out, purchases roll in, at either equal or less number, um, unless we bring on someone new, and that would be the only difference. And then we should bring that to you as part of that FTE. But but those decisions with Enterprise should be brought back to council also, and, and we're waiting to hear their proposal for what it is they're going to do for us economically, whether or not that makes sense to the council to go forward with that. And at the time the Enterprise presented to the council at that time, it was, a, it was actually a very good offer because, again, we have reduced revenue available for the purchase of vehicles. Um, I know the county also uh, went through the same program and several of the other cities. So, um, again, it was a good program at the time. It's just we would rather use cash as we can um, and just have only vehicle outright rather than going through the turnover and the change and the turnover and the change. I, I just I don't want to belabor this too much, but I believe that what Enterprise did with those Sierras was they gave money back, say, ten to twelve thousand dollars for each vehicle. How that manifested itself to the city of Mount Dora is it reduced what our lease payment was every month. Hmm. So er, every month we're we're paying off a more expensive vehicle for a, a lower price. That's that's essentially what's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my question is then, at what point in time can you tell us exactly how many vehicles we own? Four <laughs> lease. Well, we, Tom, we know how many we lease. Um, and we, again, the, the outright own, I would just have to go get that spreadsheet. But again, I think it's 12 to 14, somewhere in that range. It was a small number of, ve of vehicles. That we actually have a schedule, okay. yes. Okay. okay. And, and we can, for now, from, after this point, always put that schedule in with these types of of um, agenda items with no problem. 
we do get that from Enterprise, and then we have our own, and then we have the Bank Corp. Okay. Anyone from the audience wants, wish to discuss? Ms. Teller. Lori Tillett, 101 North Grandview, number 106. The, at what point did, what, was it decided that buy is now more financially um, better than lease? I remember several years ago when it was decided that it, we would lease vehicles because we didn't, we could turn them in and keep them in a newer condition and not have, you know, um, old vehicles that required additional maintenance. So I guess I'm just kind of curious as to what has changed. So now purchasing vehicles is more uh, fiscally uh, beneficial than leasing. So again, to the point for the protective services, um, there's a, a commitment on the city. We have to spend the monies for those that department. Those five purchases uh, make clear sense. The money in the building department can only be spent for the building department. So for that one, it's actually a, a very clear decision. Um, to be honest with you, when we looked at it initially, we should have done that from an initial point of view for the protective services for that department. Um, it becomes... Um, uh, the number of vehicles, um, as I recall reading the data later on the lease, um, I think to the point of Ms. Tilla is the fact that they gave us options and the turnover rate and the return, again, these 12 months and what we receive in return to turn back in those vehicles and then receive off on the next set of vehicles was very, it was very appealing, very lucrative for the city. Um, the amount of, in the sense that the annual payment for lease vehicles would go down a little bit from year over year, and then you'd hit that third or fourth year, and of course then it goes back up a little bit again, but then it goes back down and, and so forth. So again, it's looking at the leases that are available, the programs that are available, but for the protective services, it's definitely a benefit to them because of the statute change. And again, we'll look at cash as you buy every year, looking to see if that's the best benefit to the city and present that. I think it's a year-on-year -year basis of what has been presented to us from the different uh, providers, not just the lease company. Oh. Oh, okay, so again, point of clarification. It's restricted money that can only be used certain ways. Is there anything else that can be bought with that money, or is it only vehicles? No, it's anything in that department. So See, that's, I guess that's what I'm thinking then. So you've actually made a decision then, your team, you and your team have made a decision that that's how you want to use that money. That if there were other things that were needed in that department, that money could be used for them also, and we wouldn't be buying new vehicles. So... Um, Yes and no. We did last year. We did the computer screens and we upgraded the screens. We also did the um, some of the online uh, software. So we've made those changes every year. So we continue to reinvest those monies that they have in their revenue account or their fund balance back into that department. Um, there was a need for vehicles. Uh, again, one more. As as mentioned earlier, we went from four to five. So we knew we'd have to purchase one. Um, looking at that department and the restriction, yes, to the fund balance also drove the direction that we need to look at purchasing those, again, to stay within the restrictions of the fund balance. But we have still been presenting annually um, in the budget process the need for that department and spending those monies um, right immediately as part of capital outlay if you look at the past capital outlay for that division. Mr. Ralston. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I, re I can validate my memory with Ms. Tillett's uh, a memory about three years ago or so when we were talking about leasing and, and what a good deal that was and since then uh, even uh, within the last half a year I've heard some citizens question why don't we buy vehicles so I'm trusting the management to do the best for us financially uh, and from a management standpoint uh, as I said before I don't have the skill set to, to uh, I, I can question it, but I don't have the skill sets to make those decisions. And it seems to me, in my limited reading of the documents we've got here, this is a wise process of turning these over because it's financially uh, and fiscally prudent, based on what I've heard you say and what I've read. So uh, I support uh, I support the resolution. Thank you, Ms. Stiles. 
Um, so when we get the information from Enterprise, will the council be presented with, okay, here's what it would cost to lease, here's what it would cost to buy, and we make a decision on what's better? Oh, yes. So that all would have come back to you as right. a decision point. Yes. Okay. And then just also to clarify on the building department, it's not, at, or protective services, it's not that protective services is, is low on funds and we went out and said, hey, let's buy five new trucks. It's I mean, I get that the budget. Correct. It's, it's sort of like CRA money. You have got to prove that this money is being spent spent on the building department. Correct. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And there was a need. They did look at the fact that we're adding people, and there's a need for the vehicles. We just looked at what's the best way of using those funds. Again, uh, along with the other programs that we submitted last year. <coughs> we're buying these cars. Mm -hmm. How are they going to be maintained? So we'll also have to um, reach out to uh, Firestone, which was one of the companies that we looked at before. We'll have to put a bid out and we'll have to have someone maintain them. Uh, Firestone was the one we had on record before. Okay. We do not have a fleet service department. No, we don't. No. According to the Sheriff's Ag Association agreement, they are under warranty for some time. They will be, but we'll still reach out and go through that process so we have uh, the emergency fallback. But we do have to, to go through that contract again because when um, uh, Tom looked at it, Firestone was not it was not up to date. So we would have to go back and look to see who would apply. But they were the ones who applied last time, and they were awarded that bid. So then the reality is that once we're out of warranty with these new vehicles, <coughs> excuse me, that we're buying, we're also going to have an additional cost. So this is not a true full cost of buying these vehicles. That's correct. We'll have to put money in each year's budget for those. Okay, so I would, I would hope in the future what I would like to see would be the total cost for bringing this on because it, to me we're like two-thirds of the way there or, or three-fourths of the way there, but we still got another piece that once they're out of warranty it's going to cost more, so that's a new budgeted line, which is a new cost then to our citizens. Okay. Okay, any other discussion up here? I can't remember if I went to audience. Not. Oh, Miss Teller, that's right. Thank you, Miss Teller. <laughs> okay, back to council. Roll call, please. Oh, we don't, oh we don't I need a motion. I'm sorry. Uh, I move approval of 2019-193. Uh, Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, roll call, please. Mr. Robson? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Ms. Burnett? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Tucker? No. Ms. Style? Yes. Mayor Hoax? Yes. Okay. Resolution number 2020 10, fiber optic upgrades, Ms. Stout. Resolution number 2020 10, a resolution of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to fiber optic upgrades, providing for legislative findings and intent providing authorization to purchase, providing for authority to the city manager for implementing administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for scrivener's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for separability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, so Jim Faulkner, uh, let Jim come up. Um, he actually does not have the opportunity very often, so this is a good opportunity for him to come and give you an update on the fiber optics upgrades. Good afternoon, Mayor Council. Um, this is to extend the fiber from our existing location at the water treatment plant one, which we just completed. Um, it's going to take us to Collie Lot, MLK, and then on to the northwest corner of 11th Avenue and Unser. And along the way, there's a couple of locations that we have provisions for additional lateral connectivity to go to the disc. Uh, golf courts, the tennis courts, the pool, and the Frank Brown Sports Complex. So going to MLK and Cauley Lot, it's going to provide network services, which includes internet and Wi-Fi capabilities to those locations, and it puts the camera systems we already have onto our network so um, they can be uh, viewed remotely. I have, a, I have a question. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it seems to me to be why it's a wise choice to keep, well, we know we're going to do fiber optic throughout the city, but it's a wise choice to do it now through this area because all of the 
park amenities that we're planning to improve under our park plan, and the discussion you hear, heard here at the beginning of the meeting, would all be connected, would be a connectivity ideal, if that's the right way to put it. It seems to me that fits hand in glove uh, to the process of the parks that we're trying to improve. That, that is correct. And it also allows us, from this point of view, we're trying to develop a ring that is redundant. It allows us to have breaks in the network and it's self healing so the connectivity stays up. But going from this location at 11th and Unser, uh, it allows us to go to the location of the new fire station and then across 441 to the water treatment plant two, the wastewater treatment plant two, and then on over to the lift station at Round Lake and then come back to Gilbert Park. And then we have to deal with the west side, which is going to be the uh, wastewater one and the other fire station. Ms. Straw, uh, Jim, is this fiber strong enough that someone in their house along the route can pick up the internet and use it? <laughs> No, the fiber, the fiber itself does not allow that. Okay. Um, access points, kind of like you see here in the, the roof, um, those will be placed on the public buildings. And the, yes, they, they do have a, a distance, so you have to be fairly close to the buildings to get that, but it does make it available. Um, like, for instance, MLK on the inside, and as I understand, you know, there's tutoring and there's other things. We have meetings there. This will allow us to be connected to the networks. Mr. Massey? Jim, I appreciate that you all have, have uh, visioned this and gone about it in a logical fashion. This is the same company. I noticed that some of this uh, run is uh, pole to pole, not underground. Correct. Uh, the cost uh, appears to be within a reasonable vein, and I'm glad to see that we're ever increasing that circle to take in existing as well as future facilities. I think it's probably a wise move. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Massey. Ms. Hayes? Can I just say one thing on the pole to pole, and, and, and um, Jim and or Steve could correct. Some of the pole to pole may actually be underground in the future phase of us moving some of our electric underground. We'll move that uh, fiber underground at that time, but it would be cost effective at that point in time as we proceed with the phasing of that, uh, in, especially in the downtown area. Yeah. Starting aerial, I just want to say it's roughly 30% cheaper to go aerial than it is to underground. Uh, unless we're doing some of the work, such as the, the water or reclaimed uh, in-ground work. When they do that, if they place the conduit, then it's just us pulling the fiber through, which is a, it's much cheaper. Now, now, does this get over to Flores Park also? Yet? Oh, um, no. No. So is that next quite. phase? Well, I'm, I'm looking at That's a whole issue of getting security over there is we don't have the ability yeah, to fix. It, it's, for me, it's trying to Camera look something. where... You know, the funding I'm limited to on on getting this out there with the infrastructure uh, tax. And so the funding is going to dictate pretty much where we're going. We're trying to get a DEO grant to help get this out to the east side and move to the internal parts because I still have to do these laterals here as well. But yes, that is on the, on the list. Okay, anyone else here? Coming. Mr. Carlson? I know that the Northeast CRA and the, and the, board, the advisory board and the residents of that area around the MLK Center will be delighted when this happens. Delighted. Okay. Anyone from the public wish to speak on this agenda item? Back to council on any kind of motion. Moved or approved. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Ms. Burtnett? Yes. Mr. Rolson? Yes. Ms. Stile? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mayor Jerome? Mayor Hoax, I apologize. Old habits die hard, I apologize. <laughs> Mayor Hoax? Yes. I was trying to think of a comment for you. That's <laughs> not <laughs> It's going to be Sorry. cute. Sorry. Uh, no, don't apologize. <laughs> Things come out of my mouth sometimes that I'm supposed to either. <laughs> what happens? Okay, Res <laughs> resolution 2020-11, change order number two for Commercial Industry Corporation. Resolution number 2020-11, a resolution of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to Amendment 2 to the agreement with the Commercial Industrial Corporation. 
providing for legislative findings and intent, providing for approval of Amendment 2, an authorization to execute, providing for the implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for Scribner's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Ms. Hayes. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Council members. Joe Grisakis. Joe. Um, so we'll talk about this, uh, the utility work on 441. Um, and Joe, I know you're going to speak to the SRF loans involved and, and so forth as to uh, when we uh, began those loans and uh, the amount of years that we have um, left with those as well as interest rates. Okay. So, Council, before you, I'm, I'm going to call Commercial Industry of Corp CIC from here on out. Okay. Um, CIC has, has uh, basically was contracted with this project. Uh, it is specifically to move the water, sewer, and reclaim lines out of the DOT right away onto our own property. This project started five years ago. When we started this project, um, Advent Health was not there. Uh, we believed we were going to be through that, but through permitting, it got delayed. Uh, so through that process, we acquired a $4.2 million loan from the SRF funds to do the project relocation. The, there's two parts to that SRF loan. There's a water loan and there's a sewer portion of that. The water loan is $1.669173 million. Uh, it's got an interest rate of 0.54% interest. It's almost nothing. Sewer is, uh, let's see, 2.734 million and change, and it is a little higher interest rate. It's 2.26 interest rate. Those uh, loans will be paid off over over 20 years. Uh, we also have a DOT um, economic grant, which is a million dollars, and it's basically anything we can do to uh, promote economics in this project. Essentially, we're using it to pay for this the. Uh, engineering services for this thing and any change orders and if there's any left over we're going to buy down the loan for SRF with the remainder on it. So that's how we're funding the project. Um, the first change order which is in your packet, um, delightfully so, DOT came to us and said we don't believe the secondary road in front of the Mount Dora Country Club is needed anymore and we won't support it with our six laning project. So we went back and looked at the contract and we found that it was $19,000 savings by actually putting that pipe, open trenching it to the road and just going underneath the Country Club Road for an undirect bore underneath that. So that was a huge savings and we met with the Country Club out there and the Country Club was delighted because they didn't like the road there and they volunteered to basically water the grass so they're going to keep it up. So that was a positive. And then we got to Advent Health. The Advent Health change order initially was 300000 And we said, we can't do that. So we started looking about different ways to do it. Advent Health is now operational. They were not even breaking ground when this was thought of, this project. So the change order is just to do the extra directional work to keep them operational without any interruptions to their shop. We would have done it to begin with. The pricing is all there, so that's the project. And I answer all the questions that for council. Thank you. Thank you, council. He's explained it well. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, can we just clarify again how we didn't foresee that Advent Health was going to be built, and we'd have to. Spend this money. We spend, you know, during the process, you spend, and the first thing you do when you go to do a project like this is you do underground utility locations and, and site locations. They weren't there. So a little later on, three years later, typically when you're getting close to the project, you redo it. They still weren't in the ground when we went back to that process. Uh, when we did, when we started to get the loans and the, you know, for this process, they were starting to, you know, get their permits and stuff like that. We were still ahead of them. The problem was, is DOT took seven months to approve. Since we're touching their right away in some spots, we have to get their final approval. They took seven months after our award to allow us to start our project. They would not, since they were giving us the money for the DOE grant or DO, the economic grant, they had us by the, you know, short hairs. 
So are you saying that we thought we would have the we utility thought we'd be in there before, before them. Advent was built? Yes. Okay. And Advent has been very helpful was that they delayed putting their sidewalk in so that we could do some more digging in their front of their property. They've been, you know, they were helpful in bringing them that price down. It's very expensive to bore underground. It's a lot cheaper to, to open, cut the, you know, the, and put pipes in. So once we knew Advent Health was going to be built and they broke ground, there was still no way around it because we have to wait for the permitting yeah. process, which was delayed seven months? Yeah. And if, if Advent Health would have been there, we would have directionally drilled this anyway. It would have been the same cost. We're not paying any more for the service. If, if they would have been in the ground, we would have designed it around them just like we're doing now. It's not adding anything to the kind. The price is what the price is. It's just we found the conflict that we have to pay for. And any other questions? Oh, it's a, yes, a question, please, Mayor. Thank you. It seems to me, as I read this, we can, quote, blame F, uh, FDOT for part of the uh, delay, but delay because of the delay. But we still have to do. We still have to do the, the process. work, and and again, you know, who, basically, whenever you're doing utility work, who's ever there first, the other person has to go around. So who's ever coming in, you know, next in line has to pay. And, and I say it's well, unfortunate. I say blame in quotation marks because they gave us a million dollars yeah. uh, to help yeah. out. So I don't want to bite the hand that's fed us uh, very much, but. Uh, and, and, and they understand large projects like this. Um, there is no gatekeeper to what goes on in there. There are going to be some other change orders for this. It, there are, there, you know, phone company, you know, the, the cable companies. They all directional drill stuff in there, and there's no record of the new stuff going in. We'll find it as we go along, and we'll, we'll have some more. But we're only paying for the cost, you know, to change the pipe or go around or whatever. They're, they're not major, but this is expensive pipe. You so it seems that. like a lot to you and me. Be nice to have that green pipe sticking out of the ground, yeah. finally connected to something. <laughs> Anyone else on council? Ms. Burnett? The taxpayers are not happy about the water prices, and so are they? should they expect an addition? No, this, this, this was all funded with, the, um, evaluated with this capital project, and these loans, um, are known as, as costs of the, of the utility system. Okay. And, and DOT actually understood that they were impacting us. And that's why they gave us the million dollar grant to help buy this project down. And we're hoping to buy it down a little bit more than what the pro contract price was. And actually PRMG considered this project when they bought the rates to council to consider, as well as all projects that were in the capital outlay for the three year program. Um, and so the current rates are built on all those projects. Um, even um, considering that we may have change orders, we adjust the project if that's what's needed. Again, the rate doesn't change. Um, it still funds all of those issues. And then again, every three years, the council said, okay, we're going to go and look at the rates, and we readjust. So that's part of what we bring to you is the assumption that it all works in that same dollar amount. We're not asking for anything more or change anything that's out there. Anyone else in council? We good? Anyone from the audience wish to speak on this agenda item? Back to council, entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. I'll get it right this time. <laughs> Mr. Massey? Yes. Mr. Rothson? Yes. Ms. Burtnett? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Ms. Style? Yes. Mayor Hope? Yes. <laughs> Resolution number 2020-17, approval of agreement with Architects Design Group for Architectural Design Services for the new Public Works facility. Ms. Stephan. Resolution number 2020-17, a resolution of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to the professional architect, architectural design services for City Public Works facility. Providing for legislative findings and intent, providing approval of agreement and authorization to execute, Providing for the implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for scrivener's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. So, um, Marilyn Douglas, our purchasing manager, is going to come up and give you some information. Uh, Chet Cranworth is also going to come up and he'll present some information. Um, and um, I will just say that um, I know that. Um, 
uh, Vance is here in the audience. He gave us a list of questions that he had, that he had presented to us late uh, at a date past Friday or something to that effect. So we would tried to address, I'm not sure when it came in Vance, we've tried to address, uh, it, it's still I will say it though because Marilyn's up here. So as uh, she presents um, the two items that you had concerns for, we're trying to present those questions, answers to those questions in the presentation just so that you know. Um, I didn't have a question about I know, this one. but she'll be up here for the next two. Okay. That's the reason I wanted to say that. I may not introduce her again for the next one, so thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you, Robin. Um, my name is Marilyn Douglas. I'm the purchasing manager. And um, I received some questions. Um, what I'd like to do is address the uh, item resolution number 2020-17. Initially, uh, that's the RFQ for the architectural design services for the public works facility. Um, kind of like to give a little background on how we arrived uh, at this selection. What we do is we go through an RFQ process, which is a request for qualifications. That is dictated by statute as to the process that we have to use. That falls under the Consultant's Competitive Negotiation Act. Uh, you can find that under statute uh, 287 um, Initially, when we, when we look at an RFQ, it's all qualification based. We cannot look at price, we cannot consider price, it's all qualification. So that's how that uh, RFQ was structured, following the rules. Um, what we ended up doing, we had um, a short, we had an initial evaluation committee. The evalu evaluation committee is selected, it's made up of uh, staff members typically, and um, all of them have pertinent experience or knowledge and, they're select and when they're selected to put on to an, um, an evaluation committee. And what we did was we do our initial scoring um, of all the viable options, uh, proposals that are submitted. The um, evaluation committee scores those proposals and then there's a ranking that's determined based on that scoring. The scoring, those that are shortlisted, usually are the top three ranked firms. Um, the evaluation committee then at that point determines if they want to move forward with an award or recommendation of award, my apologies, or if they want to um, hold a question and answer session, interview session, presentations, just an additional step if they feel like they need more information or they want to get a better feel for the, the firm. Um, in this case, they did take that second step. They chose to do a QA and a and uh, presentations. And then what they do is they then score those firms on their Q&A responses and on those presentations that they do. It was a 40 minute presentation, I'm sorry, 10 minute presentation, 20 minute uh, Q&A. So um, basically at that point, that scoring is then utilized to determine the ranking for those that were shortlisted. And of those three, uh, architectural design services, or I'm sorry, architectural design group, were the um, top scoring firm. So that's the firm that you see as a recommendation of the work in front of you. Now, um, we actually brought it to council approval on August the 20th to approve entering into a negotiation stage with ADG, or Architectural Design Group. Um, council approved that, so we moved forward with that uh, negotiation phase. And in this situation, what we do is we request a rate sheet, which is their typically their hourly rate. It's outlined for all of their staff members, various positions within their firm. And we can, at that point, take that rate sheet we have them look at the project. They can establish the number of hours that they're, they're looking at uh, would need to be applied to each uh, specific task um, and the number of hours and the, using that rate sheet and then also dictating to us or telling us what um, level of personnel is going to be assigned. So you have their hourly rate. You have the personnel that would be they would be charging or using for that task. And then you have the number of hours that they say that they would apply to that project or to that task. Um, we can negotiate on the level of staff, whether it's a senior project manager versus a, a junior project manager. We could do the same work. 
at a lower rate. Uh, we can also negotiate on the number of hours that they indicate that they are going to need to accomplish the task. So that's where the negotiations come into play. Um, based on what you have in front of you in your packet, um, we are asking you to consider for approval um, the uh, phase one component for uh, architecture, architect design group for architectural design services for the public works facility. And this, um, this cost is for the phase one only. This is to get the project rolling. They need the information that they will gather through this phase one task. And then once they have this information gathered, they will be able to provide us with the additional um, phase work and costs that are associated with that. There are multiple phases, but it will uh, ultimately, we would come back to you with the cost of those at future um, phases. Yeah. Any questions? Is it normal to take five months? If, we, if it was approved in August and it's, this is now February, is, it, is that a normal time it takes to get to this point? No, ma'am, it should not. I will be honest with you, it should not. Um, this kind of came along, it, it, we had several going at one time. Okay. Um, I have a staff of two, no excuses. But um, then we got caught into the uh, year-end processes and our physical inventory processes. So I kind of all just came. Okay, I just was curious as to what the process normally, time normally takes. Normally it's about an eight-week process for an RFQ. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit longer depending on how many times the committee wants to meet. But yeah. Typically about okay. weeks. Questions from council? Mayor. So just to understand in a very simplified way the process, we we have ranked the various contenders that we're buying for this job, mm -hmm. these services. Yes. Then we six months ago or whatever authorized negotiations with the number one person. Yes, and sir. you entered into those negotiations as you explain, and now based upon entering into those negotiations, uh, we are here to consider approving post-negotiation this, this for, for phase a, one only. For phase one. Yes, just I'm, for phase one. I'm fine. Thank you very much. And do we know how many phases there will be? Um, I, I believe I saw five in there. Yes. I believe it's five. They, they had, I can't remember if they, we attached everything or if they just the, sent us the phase one. They attached the others. They're just they attach the but, others. But those are just blank. CA, I believe. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay. So and we won't have cost for them until we complete the data collection for this yes, phase. And then is it one phase after another, or will we have then the cost for the rest the other four phases? The, I, I'm I am anticipating that they might be able to do each individual phase, or they might come back and have a cost for maybe the next two, but then we'll have to return for the later phases. I'm not sure. It may depend on what they find under phase one. Typically, I mean, it's fa phase two is the site analysis, master planning, survey, so forth, and the conception build design will take some time, but they'll probably go into that. Um, and then the community outreach program and, and the estimated uh, uh, development costs, I think you'll see those kind of together again. So I think you'll see Phase, I'm gonna, she, they call it B, C, D, E, um, different ones. So I think you'll see B, which is very extended, and C, maybe a, two costs, and then from there D and E should come in pretty close at the same timing. I guess, and again, I'm just trying to visualize this, and I understand I'm not being critical at all. And perhaps we need to look at your staffing. I don't know. But it took five months to get to this one for us to be able to approve it, then they're going to gather that. At what point are we finally going to break ground to get the public works? And it can't be ground, if I understand, it, ground can't be broken until we have all the design work done, correct? So I guess I'm just concerned that what is there we need to do to get ourselves in a better position because will not costs go up as it takes longer and longer to get it done? I, I, I'm just trying to understand it, Paul. Sure. Um, I, I think, again, the, the, the longest time period is in this initial phase negotiations. The others are, um, again, um, kind of predetermined, and 
Um, Chet may even be able to speak a little bit to some of the time period it takes on the site, uh, the conceptual building, and so forth. But I think those will move quicker. Again, to Marilyn's point, um, this was this was they they worked with her. Then she may may have reached back out to them, and then back and forth. You're not going to have that going forward. They're going to give us data, just like the the fire department. They are doing the survey right now, so they'll get the information from the fire department. Um, they'll come back and they'll present that data, and then they're going to say, okay, this is what we need to do to move forward. So I think that's what we're going to also see from ADG. They're going to come in and they're going to do this work. They're going to come back and say, this is what we need to do to move forward. So it's not as much negotiation with Maryland and the purchasing as it is bringing it back to you. So it's that three week time period from the time they tell us they're ready to present something back to you that gets it on the agenda that you should see as the delay more than anything. Okay. Ms. Burnett? So ADG, when we approve this, it, that we are approving not only phase one, but we're approving them for all five phases. Is that correct? Yes, I mean, they would. Complete the project. They were approved through the RFP process as right. the vendor. As we the selected vendor. them. We selected them earlier. Yes. Five months ago. Right? <laughs> this is a committed marriage. <laughs> we're moving down. We just don't know all the cost yet, unfortunately. But, and because it's a process, so it's not. I'm, I misspoke by saying. See, I misspoke. But speak to when. It's a process, so. Through the process and the data you have to have, you can't actually determine your cost. And then, but my only concern is we got to keep it moving here now because exactly. uh, you know we want to have the public works building up and um, it's a big project. functional. It's a huge project. It's and a that, huge project. And that's really something to consider in this. It is a really big project, so you want to do it like this. You don't want to do it based on bid and lowest price. You want to no. do it based on qualifications. And then you go through this process with someone that you know is qualified to do the work. Anyone else? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this? Yes, sir. Come on up to the podium. I was just, I was just sitting. I was just. I, I, you need to tell me your address and oh, name oh, and address Bar for the Bar record. Bar Till Coleman, 917 Grand Avenue, Mount Dora, 32757. Uh, I was just sitting back there listening, and I, I was just, it kept, I kept wondering, shouldn't there be a total projected cost on any building before the building starts, or, or how does that, that work? I mean, how do you break ground and not know what you're breaking ground for? I mean, the, the total, total projected, I mean, nobody holds anybody to the, to the amount, but there should be a total projected cost. I'll let Ms. Hayes answer, but we do, we, we do have a ballpark. <laughs> so, so when we put the RQ out there, there was some information that was put out there that actually stated the size of, or the generalization of the use of the building and um, the total cost of the building to include the purchase of land and everything. So we did have a general cost um, price. Um, again, we're hoping not to have to use all that money. We'd like it to cost less than that. And that's the reason we go through this process is also for them to have to give us the costing out of each process so that we can so, narrow down and what we call um, a value engineer as we go through the CMAR process and the construction process. And so that process would be a process of elimination and decision making? That's correct. Yes. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Pastor Coleman. Okay. Anyone else wish to speak? Back to council. I'll entertain a motion. I move approval of 2020-17. Motion and second. Roll call, please. Mr. Rolfson? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Ms. Stile? Yes. Ms. Burtnett? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mayor Hoax? Yes. Resolution number 2020-18. Authorization to negotiate for construction manager at risk CMAR services for the public works facility, Ms. Stephan. Resolution number 2020-18, a resolution of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to construction manager at risk services for the new public works facility, providing for legislative findings and intent, providing for acceptance of rankings and authorization to negotiate, providing for the implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for Scrivener's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you. Ms. Hayes. 
Uh, yes, again, as I mentioned earlier, Ms. Marilyn Douglas will come up and, and present, and Chet Kramer will come up and present the data. Um, okay, for the uh, 19 PW036, the C uh, construction manager at risk services for the public works facility, um, I refer to it as CMAR. I'll Sorry. Thank you. You're soft spoken. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, what we did, we started this process um, initially quite some time ago. Um, mm -hmm. We went through a process, we had some issues with the solicitation. Um, we ran into <coughs> We had the initial scoring. It followed the same process as with the, the um, design services. It was an RFQ uh, due to our policy stating that all professional services have to be treated as if they were a CCNA. So we, we follow that same process. Um, the initial scoring with the committee, the evaluation committee, um, we ended up with uh, Ajax, Evergreen, and Wharton Smith. Uh, Evergreen and Wharton Smith were actually tied for second. So they chose, the evaluation committee chose to move all three of those forward for um, a QA and a and interview session, presentation. Uh, they did that, uh, they met, they scored them based on their presentation and their interview with the committee, same as we did with the design. Uh, based on that, that resulted in a tie between Evergreen and Ajax for the top rank, for the rank number one. So we went to our uh, tiebreaker processes. And those processes were outlined in the solicitation document. And in that solicitation document, went through each one of those tiebreakers. Both of the vendors, both of the firms, were equal. Those tiebreakers did not break the tie. Mm -hmm. I will be honest with you, I've never had that happen before. So, uh, we convened, uh, we, well, the committee decided what they would wait. They wanted to reconvene, reconsider, out what we needed to do is from our standpoint. We had followed our uh, policy, we had followed our uh, solicitation requirements, so at that point we had to come up with a method of breaking the tie. So what we did, we reconvened on June 20th. Um, the committee members, they reviewed everything, we went back, <coughs> we couldn't come up with a solid way to break the count, the, the tie at that time. And we could not reconvene the committee after June 20th. One of the committee members um, had tendered his resignation, resignation with the city. So we were not going to be able to reconvene with the same committee, which created a problem. He had all the information. He was aware of all the process. It created a problem. So what we ended up doing was we uh, had to fall back and cancel the solicitation. And we chose to reissue a new solicitation for the services. Um, we had all new committee members, except for one. One was on both. Um, so we had a fresh start, basically. Went through the same process. Committee members all evaluated the, the respondents' proposals, shortlisted the top three, met they wanted to do the Q&A and the uh, interviews again. So we went through that process. We ended up, basically, with a final award or recommendation of award for Ajax Construction. And uh, they were the top ranked firm. We did not have a tie under that solicitation. So we moved forward. Um, typically what I'd like to say is under our evaluation committees, we typically have a committee that ranges anywhere from three to seven, made up of staff as I mentioned before. Um, in this case, most of the time, the average is about five. They all bring their perspective, they all bring their um, experience and knowledge. And in this case, we did have three that do have construction knowledge that were on that committee. Um, so we felt that we had a good, fair solicitation process. Um, I think that's a bit. So I think you also made a few changes when you went out to bid. So you yes. Talk about the changes. Yes, we did make a few changes to the solicitation. We extended the um, litigation review period from five years, as we did in the first solicitation. We took it out to ten years in the second solicitation. Um, we also added in some additional tiebreakers, just in case we ran into a problem similar to the first time. Um, I think. 
We didn't. Everything went smoothly. Um, we did forward the litigation. We had told them everybody that we were going to have litigation reviewed by city attorney, and that the comments would be provided based on that litigation and, and what she found in her research. Um, and I believe that we will do that tonight. Um, also, the number of members on the team, uh, no matter what, there's a member from finance on every team. Mm -hmm. uh, we do rotate that me that member around, so sometimes it may be the finance director, sometimes the uh, finance, the assistant finance director, and sometimes um, uh, one of the staff accountants also may be part of that. Um, if it's a construction project, now that Chet's on board, he's on, he's on that team. Robert Harper was a construction person. He was also on the team. Um, Joe has built several facilities and different uh, items at other cities and counties he's been uh, or has resided at before here. So, again, we make sure that we have those members on the team uh, because they have the experience. They know how long it takes to go through and what you may have to, um, what you may expose, be exposed to, and what you might have to face. So, um, again, when uh, Marilyn presents suggestions, um, which is what she does. So um, I don't present anything to her. I approve the suggestions that she comes up with. If she's struggling with someone, she may reach out and ask. But um, really, she looks at the total team and the members available um, that may have a specialty in that field and suggest names. And then, again, if, on occasion, I will change them um, and we'll add someone else to the team or, or make it a seven-member team. The larger the team, the more difficult, more difficult it, it is to, to go through the process. So the five number seems to be an ideal number um, to have good conversation and to be able to give good experiences off to the, to the members to be able to give them something to, to use and feed on. Thank you. Check. Good evening. Uh, the, the first of this I was asked to address, or maybe just inform, was the, the CMAR process. So this is only to negotiate with the CMAR contractor that was selected. Um, the CMAR process is, is exactly what it is. Construction manager at risk. They're assuming all the risk of this project as we move forward to the next steps. Um, kind of the old process of this you, you, you're probably familiar with is the design build. So that, that's really the only other option. Um, that, in, in my personal, my professional opinion, uh, in the private sector, that, that is, you're putting all your eggs in, in one basket with that process. So you're going to a large firm that will design and ultimately build your, your building or whatever it may be. Uh, they, they hold the keys to it all. With this process, um, we are utilizing a construction manager to weigh in in the design phase. Um, they can challenge the architect, they can challenge the city, uh, and really just bring their expertise to the table so that we get ultimately what we want for the most cost-effective manner. Um, I, I am all for this process and, and uh, I think it's very wise of the city to, to utilize it. Many of our neighboring cities uh, utilize this process. It's, it's become very popular because it's always, it is in the best interest of the client, which is the city in this, in this case. And the CMAR, they still must, uh, must follow our uh, guidelines and purchasing policies and three quotes and so forth. There's a requirement for them to, to follow some of those guidelines that so that you're just now out there purchasing or uh, allowing a purchase, correct? Yes, um, the, the term used in the private sector uh, would be open book. So that, that's, the, that's how this process works. Um, Ajax, in this case, would have to bring three quotes for, for everything they're going to purchase for this project for our review. So there, there's no hiding cost, there's no fudging cost. Um, it, is, it is an open book policy. So we as a, as a city, as a staff, uh, as a community, um, we know what we're spending, we know our options. So uh, very good process. Thank you. Okay, anyone on council? Ms. Stiles. Um, if there's something that the CMAR purchases for this project, the city gets to keep it when the project is over? It, we own it, mm -hmm. so yes, it is ours. Okay, that applies yes. to everything they purchase. Right, we talked about uh, some signage at one time, um, that, that if there was some signage that had to be 
used and that was something they could use. There would have to be a proration, I think is what Marilyn and I looked at, to where there would be a portion that we would own, but they may take that piece with them later. So there may be a few of those things. Again, signage was one of the small signage showing this was a field of something, um, but we don't know that that would happen. But it would typically be ours. Okay. Mr. Tuck? Uh, yes. Um, make everybody aware. I think we all got the email from Mr. Jogum today. And in that regard, uh, I think he made some valid points. I'm not saying they were, uh, some of his comments were true, not true, or anything else. But unless we see a rush to go forward with this tonight, which I don't, uh, I'd like to see this table for two weeks to give the city a chance to answer Mr. Jogum's questions and to just bring everything out. Uh, like I said, it's, I totally agree with the CMARC being done, but I see no reason to do it tonight. And I'd like to see this table for two weeks. Okay, and uh, let me understand. What what do you want accomplished in the two weeks? Well, I'd like to have Mr. Jogum's questions answered by the city. Uh, so, uh, so again, earlier, and he's welcome to speak, speak up, um, the purpose in, in Maryland and Chet addressing it was to address those questions tonight. Um, again, timing to respond, to answer them has, has not been available, but we were able to, she was able to run through those and try to present those answers tonight. And if we haven't answered those, we would be glad to answer any of those, but I do believe we've, we've addressed every one of his concerns. Again, he may still have further questions after that, um, but the point uh, that we try to do was take care of those answers with him this evening since we had not been able to respond um, in writing to his request. If he, uh, that would be up to him. At his point, when we open this to the public, mm -hmm. uh, if he tells me that his questions have been answered, I'll uh, reconsider things. But at this point, uh, if he says no, his questions have not been answered, I intend to vote against this tonight. Okay. Any any other? Comments besides that? No, no, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I think Mr. Walsh. No, I'll, I'll defer to the okay. vice mayor, and then I'll. Mr. Massey. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tuck was referring to a, uh, an email communication that I received about uh, two and a half hours before meeting time this evening, and I'm assuming that everybody got that same uh, query. Uh, I read it this afternoon and tried to understand it. It didn't appear to me to be any challenge to the qualification of the selected. Uh, the, 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 the rank order of the company is their ability to perform the task that was required. It seemed to be questions that, that dealt with the scoring and selection process, and I believe that that uh, has been satisfactorily explained to, to my concern uh, by Marilyn earlier. Uh, and the last thing had to do, not only was there concern about scoring and selection process, but there was also uh, concern about litigation history. Uh, I'd like to hear from our attorney about that. Uh, I didn't. I, I, I'm used to seeing her name on these uh, on these actions, the resolutions that come before us uh, as approving, showing that it's been reviewed by her. But uh, she wrote a memo in this one, evidently, and I'd like to hear from from the city attorney, if we may. Sure. Um, actually, I I had evaluated the original. Um, proposals in the first solicitation related to litigation um, and, and part of that was because we had a discussion here related to the litigation and what was going on um, with the litigation and some of that came out in, in actually the solicitation that we're working on for the fire stations Correct. And that's where most of the litigation was discussed to start with um, and because there was that discussion Marilyn and I had a discussion when we had the tie, um, well, should litigation be part of this process and should us evaluating it be part of the process? And I said, well, the document that you've sent out doesn't have it as, the score, as part of the score sheet. It's something that can be generally thought through by the committee members, but it's not a specific line item that you're giving points for. So let's use it as something if we need it for a tiebreaker purpose. I could present that to the council, they could evaluate it, and we could go from there. As a matter of fact, the litigation hasn't changed any at all in these three particular vendors from it, from the last time that we've talked about them. 
One of the interesting things that was brought up and brought to your attention in this email today is why did Ajax not change? Because we went back 10 years and there is a listing of several lawsuits that did not appear in their, their solicitation response and we changed our time period to 10 years. Well, so I went and looked at those cases um, that were in Lake County and interestingly, the 2007 case that was the one it was mentioned several times to, to make up like four of the different cases, all of the 2010 cases were consolidated into the 2007 case. So what that means is the judge felt that there was a motion at some point by parties in those other cases and they felt like the facts were the same in those cases and they should be consolidated and tried all at one time so there are inconsistent verdicts. Technically, that case is a 2007 case now and it is outside of our time period for reporting. So, yes sir. For, for the comment, I'm, I'm glad that you addressed that because when I looked at this this evening, uh, the earliest litigation that was raised by the uh, citizen was from 2005, there's 2007, there were four or so in 2010, and I wondered why go back so far? And now I realize that it was a part of the tiebreaker process that we imposed. It wasn't really a change in circumstances. Right. And uh, I also am generally aware, aware of having served on these before and seen, seen a lot of these companies that uh, Apex, uh, uh, Ajax rather, uh, enjoys a good reputation and they've done projects for us in the past. Uh, I'm not so concerned anymore knowing that this was at our own request to enlarge the look, to break the tie, uh, and that the litigation has all been satisfactory and finally resolved. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree with uh, Vice Mayor Massey's comments, generally speaking. And uh, as Mr. Tucker correctly said when he was speaking, uh, we all remember the last council meeting, I think it was maybe the one before, uh, that we were all elated and uh, elated and agreed with the necessity of having a CMAR, a construction manager, on such a large project that it's a money-saving process. It's a, it's a process that will help from the litigious standpoint and reduce that, those risks and so on and so forth. And the blame or the risk is always fixed uh, under the contract. And that pleases me and transfers that risk or potential liability to the expert that is doing it. Uh, and that's, that benefits not only the city but residents of the city. So I like that idea conceptually. With regard to tie-breaking concepts, my only question is, and maybe uh, our manager can answer that, or Marilyn can, does a Florida statute that is referenced speak to tie-breaking? No. City attorney can answer, okay. Um, so what I see the city did, and Marilyn and the staff that worked with this, the city attorney included, uh, is we went the extra mile because of the tie-breaking to make sure that it was a fair and defensible process extending litigation review by double, ten, five to ten years, all of that seem, impresses me as being very careful to follow the most uh, uh, appropriate process to generate fairness. So uh, I'm satisfied and I support the resolution. Thank you. Ms. Burnett. I also received the email. And I also was um, a part of Lake County Schools when this particular construction company built Montora Middle School, and it was not a uh, it was not a happy relationship. I don't know why. I just know that it wasn't. So. I, I, although I like the process a lot, I think it's really, really important. I have questions about the litigation that, because Ajax did not, he, they chose not to answer anything about that in their, in the documents I read. 
So I'm, I'm, con I'm concerned about that. I'll say that. Can our city attorney talk to their previous litigations? The um, litigation that they've mentioned actually in their what they presented to us. And is that page 17 or 19 of their uh, package? I recall reading what they had uh, put forward, and it's on that particular page, either 17 or 19. 18, okay. actually. I was close. Yep. I was close. <laughs> Only one. Um, and, and here again, something that I need to probably give you as a disclaimer. I can only go by what they give us because otherwise you're going to be paying me to scour every county and every circuit and look for lawsuits. So we have to somewhat take them at face value. We can look around the area and that's what we started to do last time just in the Orange Lake Seminole kind of area um, to see if there were other things. but. Um, what they've listed is is broad, broadly stated. They do not state the actual um, case name mm -hmm. or case number like the others do. Um, but they tell us that they uh, in two, they tell us about something in 2006 that involved them with the filing of, of a lawsuit. And I'm assuming that's where the school comes in. An incident that happened in 2006, the lawsuit wasn't until 2007, then all of those, the five others on that list that you all received from 2010 were all consolidated into that 2007, so I'm assuming that they all are from that same project. Um, and then the um, there is a third that is in 2012 that is related to a partial collapse of a parking structure. Um, they did not provide us with the information on that, and we don't have um, anything else in our solicitation um, that directs your purchasing manager to send them back to get more information on that. That's a process that we can certainly change if you'd like it changed, but you don't have that mechanism in your or direction given to your purchasing manager so that wasn't something that was requested. And so without in more information or clarification on that being requested, uh, if the committee members evaluated, they see this too, and they read this too, and I would say that that particular um, litigation type items, if you look at the sheet, and I printed it out because I wanted to be able to look directly at how we break down our points. Um, <coughs> Under proposer qualifications and experience, they get 25 points. That's maybe a location that you could think through whether litigation has an impact on that. The other team, the other part is their um, project team experience. I, I mean, I guess you could shoehorn it in there, but the other things that they receive points on are their current workload, their approach to the engagement. So. They don't really have an area for litigation. It's just kind of uh, informational. So we've not made it a focus. If it's something that you would like us to make a focus, we certainly can, and we can require them to specifically give us case name, case number, and the ability to, to be, so that we can research those. Otherwise, it, it puts the burden on you trying to chase your tail looking for something that we don't know maybe where where all they're doing business or could have been sued for that matter um, or if they were sued it, under a subsidiary name or change names or something like that we could certainly craft language for the solicitation document to be more specific and hold their feet a little bit more to the fire so that I could have something to review and bring back to you one other thought, if I may. Uh, what We expanded the look back to 10 years, yes. looking for what was our original look oh, back? Five. five. Uh, if we're going to change policy, maybe we ought to look at that too, that, that time frame. Absolutely. Okay. And, and here's the other thing. While the statute governs this process, it doesn't control it. 
Because that, that state statute is created for the purpose of governing state agencies and their purchasing. We have a purchasing policy, and we have home rule authority. So we get to make up our own rules, and we get to, to follow our own processes um, to the extent that they are not inconsistent with state law. Um, well, there aren't really state laws on this kind of thing for us. And largely what you see happen, and I would surmise before Maryland's time, Robin's time, my time, everyone's time, prior purchasing people, a lot of times we probably, you know, beg, borrowed, and stole solicitation documents from larger cities, other government entities, and we just kind of over time develop documents that we're kind of stuck with today because we've got things that are out on the street and Maryland has a two-person department and doesn't have the manpower to change every one of them. However, her and I have made a, a, a you know, pact that this is the year that the purchasing policy will be changed in totem, not just band-aids added to it. And in that process, we are also going to look at the solicitation documents at our standard forms to make sure that we are catching things that we need to catch and that there aren't inconsistencies. Because we have found inconsistencies with ourselves, within our documents and our, our solicitation and our policy. Um, so fixing some of that is, is part of the problem. Um, but in this particular situation, our scoring sheet doesn't give us the ability just to kick someone out based on litigation. Yes, sir. Thank you and your comments about that. The education process for us all is important. And thank you what you, for what you've done to help us get a good posture in terms of, uh, of contracts. Um, there was something specific in the response from Ajax that said no litigation pending which uh, says a great deal to me, and now understanding from your input that much of these litigation entries over the years were, were involving the same matter, and courts frequently do that, and then consolidate cases and, and conclude them so they're not disparate uh, findings. But uh, I'm satisfied with your explanation. I appreciate that. Mr. Olson. Uh, I think Mr. Massey duplicated my concerns again, and uh, thank you for that. I, I don't have any, I'm ready to vote. I mean, I'm ready to move on. Okay. And yet, Mrs. Burnett, I would like to see the policy that you are talking about, the, uh, including, the, uh, including the, the, the litigation in the scoring sheet. I would like to see that. Okay. And absolutely, as we're working on the purchasing policy, that will be something that we involve you in because it ultimately will be, will be a policy that you're adopting. Um, but it's it's my hope to bring us down to somewhere around 30 to 50 pages as opposed to 80 or 90. I mean, we, we have to be able to read this thing. It has to be something that, that Maryland can use and go to, that the public can understand, that the public can use um, because it is the guide for how we, we make purchases. And we absolutely, that is more of a, a process change and not a policy change, and it certainly can be easily put into the solicitation documents going forward. And then, and then you do see, um, again, annually, July and August, you start receiving all the policy changes. Those are the policies by which all of us operate that you um, dictate to us as to the changes um, in the sense of purchasing manual and all of those. So um, I will say that in 2016, I believe the purchasing policy um, when, um, was about three pages and very, um, very broad very very broad so we may have actually maybe increased it quite a bit um, and then again we need to relook at the scale the other comment I would make um, again not to overstate what we've already stated but as uh, mentioned the first um, as re as the contract states or the presentation the first um, litigation involved us uh, filing suit to protect our rights for a pending change order on a project completed in 2006 the suit has been settled and payment received the second one was in reference to an audit 
um, claim, um, and the, the claim was settled after all allegations made by the client's auditors and proven inaccurate. Now, this is their statements, but it's still in public, uh, published. And then the third one, the suit was settled after payment to the owner for, for the, from the responsible is issuers and subcontractors was negotiated. So, again, uh, to Councilmember Harmon uh, Massey's uh, point, most of these were documented and stated that they were settled to each of the other members satisfaction again you remember one other thing if i might yes mr Excuse Olson. Um, as i recall reading this is it was a lengthy document but i can re recall reading the fact that the construction manager is required to have liability insurance uh, at an adequate significant level and that certainly is additional protection because all of the risk is on their side anyway so. correct anything else from council does anyone in the audience wish to speak on this agenda item? Hi, Vance Yoakum, uh, write FiscalRangers.com, and I'm the one that sent you that memo. Uh, I, I really appreciate the work that Sherry has done here because she's explained a lot. Uh, I mean, I went through that entire legislation for five small typed pages on CCNA process, and uh, I've always looked at it as that why aren't you competing on price? And that's what got me interested. I finally had to go corral a contractor I know and ask him to explain it from his side. And yes, it finally came out something that is not explained clearly in the other legislation is that the alternative for asking the entire price up front is to uh, select a, a contract CMIR. A con construction manager, uh, based upon the qualifications, uh, you know, and basically their pitch and everything else, and who they think is good. I call it a beauty contest because there's no price involved. But then once you do that, then they sit down and, and with your purchasing department, and they go through and they do all the, the, the subcontracting, which is not clear anywhere that I could find. It wasn't to me until I finally got somebody who could lay down what was going on. Um, so the issue of selecting the construction manager at risk without having a bid is kind of resolved. I also kind of in between the lines looking at that and saying, I think the purchasing department may be overloaded. I mean, I couldn't even get an answer for her in two weeks. And, uh, and other comments have been made about that. So I think you need to look at that. Um, she was, on, yeah. she was on vacation, Vance, so we're sorry. She was out for a week on vacation. Because two weeks ago is when I tried to schedule a meeting, and then it was for last Monday, a week ago Monday, and I had a whole list to go through, not that of 20 questions. I figured I could resolve a lot of them just with verbal dialogue, and she had to cancel that meeting. And so she asked for it in writing, and by the time I put it together, it was Friday. I got no comments on it, so that's why I distributed it to you on yesterday uh, and then the city council because I, I looked at the background of everybody here on the city council. I really haven't dealt with you before, but I'm kind of amazed. I mean, this is not a city council that is like some other cities, and I've been to all 14 cities in this county, and we got people that shoot up the ceiling and get removed from office by the governor. <laughs> We got people that have uh, had sweetheart deals with the bar that they go to to sell city land to. Okay, and, and so you're, you're digressing here. So, I'll bring it back yeah. because we've got so more anyway, on the agenda. So um, anyway, part of it is I wanted you to get involved to look at that as kind of an independent perspective, and it sounds like you've done that. You're satisfied with the answers. Uh, the litigation issue, I kind of question. And then when she says it's not even in the, in the scoring system, um, because the way I read it, it was vague. And I had also dealt with Ajax in the school board issue because I was on the internal audit committee for the school board when those cases cropped up. And so I'm just kind of concerned. But at the same time, as has been mentioned, you've only been looking at local cases. I mean, why not look at, you know, do a search on Florida cases to see, I would think that'd be part of the steps that you go through, uh, just like a credit report and uh, other things. So uh, I will rely on your vote because I already kind of read the, 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 the
comments here, and uh, you can make that decision. You're aware of it. It sounds like the attorney is going to go through the procedures with purchasing, I think, and uh, and certainly uh, have some steps in there to, uh, because there are other things about, it still is not clear to me how the tiebreaker wasn't followed, because I thought tiebreaker seemed kind of obvious, but it, there's no documentation. And that's another part of it is the files don't have documentation like lawyers expect or accountants expect and did not describe the decisions made. So that's a red flag to me, and I think that you need to look at that and have some sort of a documentation package process. Uh, Thank you. We're, we're off staff. the subject of what we're doing here, and we appreciate your comments, but maybe we can take Thank those you. offline and okay. share them with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Sir, before you step away, I want to ask you please not to take exception to any comments that I have made. We sure. appreciate your input always. Uh, well, no, I mean, I wanted you guys to look at it. That's what we're all in the same want. concern. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Been helpful. Thank you. Does anyone else from the audience wish to speak on this agenda item? Back to council, Mr. Tucker. No, I have a question, Mr. Council. Is it not a Is it about this, this yes. subject here? Okay. <laughs> Very quickly, Mr. Yoko. Um, yes, sir. Are you happy with some of the answers you've heard tonight? Uh, yeah, a lot of it is just having the dialogue as opposed to, because the package that you got didn't talk about a lot of these issues, and I thought that they needed to have some visibility. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, back to council. Anything else? I'll entertain a motion. I'll, I'll move 2020-18. Uh, I prefer approval. Second. A motion and a second. Roll call, please. Mr. Robson? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Ms. Style? Yes. Ms. Burnett? A reluctant yes. <laughs> Mayor Hoke? Yes. <laughs> Mayor, may I make one comment? Yes. Um, to, um, I use your name, first name, Vance. I hope that's mm -hmm. okay since we've had several conversations. Um, we will, um, again, put a little more information. As you all know, I speak to each of you about a lot of these, and sometimes um, uh, we believe we've already had the conversation, so sometimes we miss some of the details, so we'll work um, to make sure that we maybe put some summaries in there that explain a little bit more of what has <coughs> happened, um, and all of us will, will make sure we do that going forward, just, just to bring you through the process. One other thing, if I can add to that, Mayor, it seems to me I'm pleased to hear the city attorney's active involvement in relooking at those procedures, those guidelines, uh, the policy, whatever form it takes, um, taking into consideration the discussion, Mr. Yoakum's comments, and other things like that, that would be valuable input into refining some of those. I like going back 10 years in terms of litigation, just personally, just who knows. And uh, it does cause a little extra work, and I do like the idea of our city attorney searching for things a little broader than Lake County, if that's possible, when it comes to litigation. And I know it's extra time, but I think it's valuable time spent uh, because uh, certainly statewide uh, organizations like Ajax, they have a statewide reputation, and probably beyond, but at least statewide reputation. And so they may be involved well beyond Lake County and certainly are. In fact, they are because you can see their projects uh, that go beyond Lake County. So just my thoughts. I'm pleased to hear what you're saying. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Just, yes, ma'am. In relation to what Mr. Olson just said, um, I would be in favor of them having to list that information on the application so you don't have to do all the sure. work. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I, I mean, I would, my hands would be tied. I'd be looking in, you know, every circuit that way. So absolutely. We'll, we'll just make sure that the solicitation is very clear, that they have to list within the state of Florida, both federal and state cases that they've been involved in, the case number, the case name, and any, you know, identifying information and a summary of the case. If they want to do business here, they're going to give us what we need. Thank you. Kind of like state separati separatization. Separate. Okay, we're going to move on. Resolution 20-19, approval of 6th Avenue drainage system agreement. Ms. Stephan. 
Resolution number 2020-19, a resolution of the City of Mount Dora, Florida, pertaining to improvements to the 6th Avenue drainage system, providing for legislative findings and intent, providing for approval of agreement and authorization to execute, providing for the implementation of administrative actions, providing a savings clause, providing for Scrivener's errors, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Ms. Hayes. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, Joe Krasakis um, is um, the Director um, for Stormwater and for other water utilities. So he will give you a summary of this project. Good afternoon. This project is a right of entry hold harmless agreement between some residents that abut our stormwater pond. Our stormwater pond has some settlement on it and there is some concrete on the adjacent property that has fallen off and is causing some erosion problems and technicalities there. Because the, the concrete is on private property, we work with our attorney to get a hold harmless right of agreement to go in there. We will remove the concrete. We can do that with our city forces with very little <laughs> cost on our benefit. We will then refill everything, compact everything. And this agreement also requires the homeowners, and there's multiple homeowners involved with this area, that their water comes down off of their property. It's a very steep slope and goes into our pond to put a diversion berm up with as part of the solution. So it's a great thing for us to work with our community. They're going to solve their erosion problem. We're going to solve our erosion problem, and it's a win-win. Joe, on the um, uh, agreement, um, the initial one, we were missing a couple signatures. Do we have all those homeowner signatures at this point? Okay. Yes, yes. Did, I think just the initial document that was uploaded did not have all the signatures, so um, we just need to make sure we upload that for council to see the final document. Final it's, signature. It's actually in here with all signatures on it. So. Okay. Okay, council, any questions? Just any, just anyone from the audience wish to speak on this agenda item? <coughs> Back to council, I'll entertain a motion. Move their approve. Second. Okay, roll call please. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Ms. Burtnett? Yes. Mr. Rolfson? Yes. Ms. Stile? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mayor Hopes? I believe we're going to take a five-minute break, and I'm going to say five minutes because we've got an agenda. We've got people been waiting, but I know if I don't, some people are going to start doing this. So five minutes. You look at bill under my report section. Give a copy of the order that has been signed by the mayor, so you can all see the form that it has taken, and we'll have a record of it for the clerk for public records purposes. When you said the uh, the applicant will go first, you meant the appellant. The appellant, well, he is also the applicant. Okay. All right. So, okay. yes. Okay. So, um, just uh, make sure, um, I know the mayor mentioned that she would open it um, to the public. public. First. Um, so, we want to do that before yes. Yes. the director comes up to speak. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Does anyone from the public wish to speak on this? Seeing none. And then Vince Sandersville. You want him to present, or you would prefer he to present afterwards, Sherry? Yeah, he, the appellant actually needs to go first. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Lou Ronka. I, I reside at 29222, 29222, yeah, Beauclair Drive in uh, Tavares, and I own property here in, in Mount Dora. I'm, the point contested here is that the Planning and Zoning Commission, by the way, I, I consolidated what you've already received. And in the interest of being as brief as possible tonight, I, I hope you'll hear me out. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission contends that I created my own problem <coughs> per the variance item 3B, special conditions and circumstances as a result of the actions of the applicant. I contend they, were, they erred in that decision. The Planning Commission's decision to deny me this variance was based on the fact that in 2007 <clears throat> I purchased additional land to create two R2 lots at this location. The intent was to remove the existing building, which was highly substandard at that time. A copy of the survey that I submitted at that time to the city shows the existing structure would be removed as the new property line 
went right through the, the building. So there was no question that, that the building was going to be removed. <clears throat> that plan was approved in 2007 by the city of Mount Dora. It was recorded, and to this date, the property is taxed as two separate lots, uh, two separate R2 lots. Um, and the plan to develop the site was set aside when the economy collapsed in 2007, 2008. <clears throat> so what's changed? First, <clears throat> at that time, I was faced with foreclosure uh, and losing the property. I chose at the time to make the necessary improvements to bring the property up to rentable standards by the city of Mount Dora's code. The second thing that happened <clears throat> was in 2018 when I resurrected my original plan to remove the house and proceed with, with duplex units. Um, the Historic Society or the S Historic Committee of Mount Dora expressed the preference that I either retain the entire house or I retain at least portions of the house. So at that time I took a look at my own plan and my current plan is to retain the existing house. The third thing that happened since then <clears throat> was we had a, a major storm in the area and the roof was damaged so I, I was forced to replace the roof otherwise I wasn't going to be able to meet those standards. So the special circumstances in this case and in my opinion was created by the city's preference for me to retain the building either all or in part. My current plan is to retain the existing building and build two separate homes, one on each side, that are highly compatible with the neighborhood. It should be noted that the city staff agreed that I met all seven points in the requirements for, for a variance in this case, and that included item 3B, uh, that I did not create the circumstance that, that, uh, that I'm requiring the variance for. So I'm asking you to reverse that decision and allow me the variance um, on this property. And again, my intent is to build two, two separate single-family units that are very much compatible with the neighborhood. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Anyone on council have questions? So there will be three, three single family, single homes, family homes on that. Including the existing of. one. And and I without getting into a lot of detail, I think it's in your package there. Um, you know, those those lot sizes and stuff are are, are very much within the, the tolerance of all the other homes in the neighborhood. Ms. Burnett. That, I want my dog. I'm sorry. I walk my dog by by that property, and so I, but I don't walk down Grandview. I walk down Ninth. So I see the house, and I see the side uh, on on um, on Ninth, Ninth, but I don't see Grandview, and I don't know how wide that lot is um, south of the house. Well, the original lot was a substantial size lot in its right, own. It was. Right? Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to purchase the adjoining property to the south. And at that time, again, without getting into too much detail, I came to the city and said, what will it take to meet your code requirements for two R2 lots? And that's what I did. I purchased that. I removed part of that property and added it to this one and we replatted it, and that's what I'm saying is in 2007 that plat was approved and the two lots are, are taxed to this day as two separate lots. Right. Even though the house is set in between. So it's two lots, mm -hmm. and I, so I, what I want to know is how wide the lot is that abuts the, the, top, the south of the house. The new lot you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I believe that feet. is yeah. the one that's 47 feet. 47 feet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's a number of properties that, that are less than that in the neighborhood. Right. Ms. I don't know if this is an appropriate question, Ms. Upton, but um, 
Mr. Ronka, is it your intention to live in any of these homes? No, my intention would be to probably rent the existing home, which I'm doing right now, uh, at some point improve that and then sell it. All three of them would be sold as single family residence. The thing you have to understand is even though I've, I've made improvements to make the existing one rentable, it is not uh, by today's standard is you have closets that are two feet by two feet. So it would require a major renovation to, to do it. Any other questions? Sorry. Ms. Stiles? Um, I, I've looked at all the numbers, but is it possible to, it's not possible to make it work, to make three lots work with our current code, correct? No. You couldn't make one a little bit I, smaller? I tried every way possible to meet your code uh, uh, and still retain the existing house, and it's just not possible. Okay. At this point in time, we would ask Vince Sandersfeld to come up. Thank you. <coughs> Vince Sandersfeld, Planning and Development Director. I'd like to give a quick chronology and the uh, testimony of the Planning Commission and a summary of the application and maybe clarify a couple questions of why we're here today on a variance. Um, the application was noted 6-6-19 for a variance, but it actually was filed on uh, September 16, 2019. And then it was brought before the Development Review Committee October 30th last year, and it was brought before the Planning and Zoning Commission on the 20th of November. And at that meeting they were presented a reduction of setbacks, a couple lot size of the standard zoning, and then the lot width. So there were three standards in the R2 residential zoning, and then this district is R2. R2 allows either duplex or single family, depending on the lot size. Uh, so the applicant was trying to create, and the house is sitting right in the middle of the two lots, so either you move the one home over, so forth, yes, for the variance. There's no way to get the three lots without a variance request. Uh, that has uh, not been determined with the planning commission because they need a reduction in lot width. And then one of the homes in the corner, to make the home meaningful, he was asking for reduction in the corner setback. Uh, so there's a setback reduction on one lot, and then the other two lots, in order to plat them like that, they'd have to have smaller than 7,000 square feet, which is in the R2. So there was a variable to, to request the variance of the R2 standard. So that was a presentation before the Planning and Zoning Commission of the request. The Planning and Zoning Commission uh, did not determine the historic. Uh, the Historic Preservation Board was a previous um, uh, request. It was withdrawn. Uh, the Historic Preservation Board has had no determination and has had no discussion on a demolition <coughs> certificate appropriateness. Uh, that never occurred. Uh, staff has had comments of uh, appropriateness, and that was noted in the staff report. When you apply for a demolition permit, there's certain criteria, but the Historic Preservation Board never made any determination, nor did the Planning Commission weigh that in as part of their overall decision-making of the variance. Variances, and we've seen these uh, through, throughout our uh, tenure, they ask for relief, and it's very strict. Uh, there's seven criteria, and you have to provide substantial competent evidence on each of the seven criteria. You have to find positive findings on each one. Failure to find positive on one can, can find that variance not meeting the criteria and therefore can be um, an unfavorable recommendation, which was the case in this particular variance. Uh, for the lot size, uh, when we look at the three lots, we were totaling the total site. It's 0.5 acres. It's a half acre site. And if we reshuffle it, we calculate the density. So you only can have three units which is important because today he has two lots that are duplex lots. And you can put a duplex on one lot, remove the home, it's in the middle of them, so one would have to address that issue, and put another duplex on their lot, you get it four units today. Because that's what was platted in 2008. So the Planning Commission and through the City Council in 2008 looked at a reconfiguration of the 0.5 acres and determined 
two lots. And they, did, and they planned it as a duplex lots. Or they could put two single family. But somehow that center home is going to have to be addressed because it's staggered right down the middle. Uh, so that is a component um, of the site, but it's not a component of the variance. The variance has no relationship as the variance is asking for reductions in the standards of a lot. Lot width, lot size, and a reduction in some setbacks on the one corner lot. So that's why he was trying to get the three lots reconfigured. Through the process and testimony of the Planning Commission, they determined that the plat that was provided in 2008 was an action that the applicant requested. They requested to replat the two lots and therefore set that precedence of the lots. And that action resulted in um, a behavior of the action of the applicant. That's kind of how the wordage of that section. So the Planning Commission, on a vote of five to two, determined uh, you didn't meet the criteria because you platted it all right. So why are you asking for a variance when you already requested a plat in 2008? So that you, you couldn't ask for any reduction in the lot sizes, lot width at that time. So the Planning Commission, and through the discussion and testimony and evidence of that, that plat in 2008, um, created a hardship of the action of the applicant. And therefore, the variance was denied on that. On that. Other, the other components they didn't have an issue with, but again, you have to find positive of all seven criteria, which they found negative of the one criteria, resulted in a denial. Vince, let me ask a question. Right quick. You indicated that the Planning Commission did not consider the historic preservation information. Is that because the information was not presented to them? It was noted that a demolition permit was applied for, but no action was taken. That was the only testimony provided. Okay. I'm not saying this is going to be my only question, but just while I'm thinking of it, is it that Mr. Ronka platted it in 2008 so someone else could buy this property a year from now and go through this process again and possibly have this variance granted? Uh, the applicant um, applied for the variance in 2008, the same owner today, so the same ownership back then as today. Right, so, but so I'm saying someone... if, he sold it to some, if he sold both of these lots to somebody in a year, could they come and ask for this same variance to make it three lots? They certainly could, but then would this same thing be considered um, potentially because it's your, they would have then purchased the lots knowing that the plot existed. So they would have not, it wouldn't have been a hardship that was imposed upon them. It would be their hardship that they imposed on themselves by purchasing it with that notice. Okay. And so my other question or concern is why did the at the planning and zoning commission meeting why did city staff recommend to approve this variance through the development review committee process when we analyzed the reduction of the lot width and the lot size and then the setback on the corner uh, the setback on the one corner lot really wasn't a concern with the development review committee uh, we actually amended our land development code several years ago for 20 feet on the front it's 25 on the corner, so reduction of five feet on the corner of the one lot didn't seem to be a grieved uh, type of reduction for a variance to provide the size of the house with the lot size. And so the development review committee determined through their findings and what was presented in his application would warrant approval from the staff level. New testimony was provided at Planning Commission, which brought to light of the 2008 plat. And that component of a previous action of a plat was discussed in more detail at the Planning Commission. That was available only as a surface level and application of variance the staff looked at, but more detail and testimony was provided at the hearing. And the questions were brought up by the Planning Commission about what happened in 2008 with the plat. And that discussion rolled into the action of, you, you, you determined that already, you already applied the two lots, so I mean, this doesn't make sense to ask for a variance on top of something you already requested. So they got that testimony was new at the hearing. We didn't have that through DRC. So, but with the going down to 45 feet from 60 feet of a lot width and um, under six or yeah, under 6,000 or 7,000 square feet, that would have been okay with the city staff. From the from our analysis of the application that was provided at that time, 
that was sufficient to warrant the criteria for staff's level. Okay. Yeah, you have to remember if I can add, staff isn't taking testimony or evidence. That is being presented it. under test under oath at the Planning and Zoning Commission. So they're not going to get a lot of the information that that someone someone could have. Um, he could have brought in experts to testify in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission. There are a lot of things that you don't get in the paper application. Okay. Uh, thank you. When the presentation was made to staff by the appellant or the applicant, <clears throat> was there any was there any concern that it, the 2008 issue was intentionally left off of the process? It, it was not into that detail through staff discussion. Okay. Um, that was, again, really was new discussion and new um, data uh, to analyze the drawing from the plat from 2008 at the Planning Commission stage. So um, staff's thought process of the variance and going through each one of the criteria for presentation before planning commission felt there was sufficient information and data to present a favorable uh, variance request but uh, then it was discovered and then it was discovered so uh, that that was the key key yeah. to an action previously by the same applicant to that that's the planning commission's thought process of why uh, it failed that criteria the substantial competent evidence that staff had was sufficient when we reviewed it but then the Planning Commission determined otherwise. Another thing that you all should know is it is the applicant's burden to provide the evidence as to each one of the different criteria. It is not staff's burden. And that brings up the same question I had about that. I, I'm a little concerned about the missing information about the 2008 plat issue that that wasn't presented until the commission found that out. Right. Okay. And actually the testimony was from the applicant we de determined then further um, discussion and questions were what do you mean this was planted previously so that started that dialogue which was in response to the item of the criteria okay. actions that are a result of the applicant. And you're asking for a hardship of the standards of the land development code for variance that you create that yourself. Created. Now you created two lots, and now you're asking for relief of that at another date. And they were going, that's out of bounds. Of the R2 district, the R2 district didn't have 60 foot wide lots, 7,000 square feet for single family, 10 for duplexes. No, we're going to finish up here first, and then, okay, Ms. Burnett. So, Jerry, I have an ex parte. Um, I communicated, this was before I was on the council, so this is in October, and I met with a neighbor, I, I was walking my dog and I saw the neighbor and he said that the, the owner of that particular property was going to, he wanted to ask for a variance, and he wanted to use it for his retirement, and the, the person that I spoke to said, that he, he, he expressed his hesitation about that. That's all he said. So I just wanted you to know that that was the case. Okay, and do you have the gentleman's name or just a neighbor? Did he? Adapt? It was, so I do know that, I do know his first name. I don't okay. know his last name. I think if you identify that, that's sufficient. Sandy. And the other thing, I, I noticed that the listing of the neighbors doesn't include the direct neighbors right next to this property. It only, it does, it includes the 9th Street neighbors, it includes <coughs> the people on the south of, south of, on Grandview, but not directly next door. The, uh, that's the applicant's list. Uh, we do not use that for mailing. Right. We generate our own list, which is right. within 300 feet of the subject property. Uh, because a lot of times the applicant may not capture from the tax roll um, buffering, what they call it, to determine the surrounding property ownership. So what we provided you was the actual application uh -huh. that the applicant submitted to the city, but by practice policy we use 
our standard 300 feet. So you may, it may, I don't know, I have, I'd have to go through that list and determine from our May allow. Okay. And there's a legal notice applied for each variance, as you, as you may recall. And the, the appeal hearing was noticed in the paper and notices were sent back out for this hearing tonight. So we did re notify legal ads okay. tonight. Mr. Tucker, do you have anything? The applicant would like to speak again. Is that Thank you. Um, there seems to be some question as to whether I did not reveal that I had split this lot in 2008. And I think, Vince, if you go back to your notes, I, I was very clear that I split the lot in 2008. I also have a survey, and I still have it in my file here, uh, that I presented to, to the, the uh, board, and it shows the existing house and the lot line going through it. So, you know, I did not hide that fact. Uh, there were some objections came up at the planning and zoning meeting by some of the neighbors, and uh, I, that's what created this, this whole question. But the fact is I, I did make it clear that, that I had split the lots. Thank you. Thank you. You can now uh, have discussion and entertain a motion. I didn't see any more discussion. Is there any more discussion? Okay, so now I can entertain a motion. Yes, sir. Um, I move that the City Council deny the appellant's request for a variance from the minimum setback standard <coughs> with lot and lot size. Uh, due to the fact that the applicant has failed to prove by competent substantial evidence <coughs> that the special conditions and circumstances which exist on the property do not result in the actions of the appellant because the appellant previously replied to the property in order to create the two lots upon which the existing single family structure is situated and that the council um, delegate to the mayor to sign the order without our subsequent review and approval. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Roll call. Mr. Rolfson? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Ms. Burtnett? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Ms. Style? Yes. Mayor Mayor Pope. You get two votes. <laughs> yeah, yes. I didn't. I, I caught myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So the motion is carried. Okay, let's move on to discussion items. Establishing special dates for annual recognition. Ms. Hayes. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Council Members. Um, again, as mentioned at a couple meetings ago, to discuss um, what guidelines or parameters you would like to set forth. Um, if you consider a policy going forward of establishing um, a particular day in recognition of a particular event, person, persons, whatever it might be. Um, so staff is looking for direction from you, um, basically as a consensus, base, consensus basis, um, and also some parameters in which we can go look for policies if that's what you so direct, um, in order to bring back to you uh, some options, um, you know, going forward. So. Um, up to you from that perspective to discuss and um, decide if that's what you wish for us to do. Ms. Stiles, do you have some thoughts on this? Because I think, is this something that you had brought up? Um, Actually, I think this is what Ms. Burnett brought up. Yeah. Oh, is it? Okay. Ms. Stiles is on the next item. Uh, she's, next okay, I, I had it reversed then. I apologize. Sorry. Okay. So. I would, like the, I would like to see the policy. Uh, I would like to see the staff generate the some policies related to uh, an annual so I, I understand that the proclamations are one-time deals right right 
and they would have to be perpetuated every year. And so I would like to see a policy, and I know that we, when we talked about it, we, we talked about that Mayor Drone had set up a policy for flags. Yes, and I can send that out to you as an example. Um, so um, just to clarify, staff would not present to you the policy. We would present to you several policies and let you pick the pieces and parts of those policies that you would like to include in that, um, and then we can, again, tweak it. I just need to know the parameters by which you would like for us to work uh, work with. Um, if it's the flag policy, then we can work with the flag. We gave you the, the proclamation because that's as close to this particular item as what we have. How do other towns do that? I mean, obviously, if you name a day for a particular person, during the course of a year, you can have 365 people you come up with, and then you run out of room if it, they go on forever and ever. And you know, and I understand that's the other extreme, but you know, um, we'll look. Do, to let, why don't we? Let me suggest our first step is let's see what, if any, policies are out there as to how other towns, and especially small towns, because yes. I think that's where you're going to find it more up to happen, probably. Right. right. And see if we can find something like that to begin with and sure. bring, let us see that, and then I think it'll give us a basis for discussion, because right now we're kind of <coughs> pulling pieces. At least my brain is. Yes. Mr. Olson. Thank you, Mayor. The that makes some sense to me as well. Um, I think there might be some times when this council can, obviously we have the authority to deviate from our standard <coughs> policy, there might be some time where we might want to have an annual <coughs> regular recognition, Mabel Reese Day, for example, or I'm just throwing that name out there, as some special day that is really significant that we deviate from our policy. And that's something we can consider a policy on how we should do that. I guess it's a bit of the council, but to change the policy. Okay, so does that give you enough at least to start? We'll, we'll go grab uh, if, if several cities, some smaller cities. Uh, I think our city clerk can put a, a notice out to her other city clerks. Um, mm -hmm. to reach out to yeah. them and ask if any of them have policies. Um, we'll add the flag policy and anything else that this council has created in the last two to four years um, to that mix, and then we'll send that out to you as an email. Um, then we'll bring it back as a dis discussion maybe in March, but that gives you plenty of time, and that's what we've done that in the past. Try to give you four to six weeks to kind of read through it because it, it does um, take some time to kind of figure out what you might be looking for. So we'll try to do that in the next two weeks. May or may add one other comment to the last one. Uh, I, I compliment the mayor for TV changing a little bit of the policy standard by including the council in some of the signatures mm -hmm. on there, uh, as opposed to the past, it was just the mayor's signature. And that's fine, too. It's perfectly fine because it reflects the council's desire. But it was originally, um, in my experience, just the mayor's decision and the council was not even involved, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even know uh, that there was going to be a special recognition or something. Uh, I like the idea of letting the council know as well, at least know if that's possible. It may not be sometimes because of shortness of time. But I like the idea of having it a, uh, a whole council's sig uh, signatures on that, though it's your well, and, and actually, there's two, was nice. there's two things coming, and I, that was came in there. There's two things coming up that will possibly be something for us to consider. We, as many of you know, our um, we have our teacher of the year is from our school here, and we were looking at that. And also, and I think we all got the um, email about the middle school robotics right. team, and we were looking at that also. So I've actually looked at something the city um, uh, clerk has put together for us. Um, or for me, but we'll like even expand that because the one that you did see was because of retiring council people. They, they did it that way, but I'm fine with either way. Um, but, the, you know, again, um, it'll be interesting what you find out there um, because it also becomes subjective. You have one group who may say, oh, this is the person that needs to be, sure. and other people over here say, well, I'm not sure I understand this, but I think this should be. So then you find yourself saying, okay, what is the criteria so as to how you make that decision and that's what I'm really interested to see how how that, that's done that's right yeah. and that, those are the parameters we're looking for to, to really from you and and write the policy once you've identified 
yes, 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 no, no. Uh, well, and, so. and, and you know, and maybe we even have to go beyond whether um, a day is the thing or do we have citizens that, that over the course of the years we didn't have a, an ability to recognize for their input to it. Um, one of the things I've had a uh, city manager looking for um, was the pictures of all the mayors we used to have in the room in there only because I had some citizens come ask me about previous mayors and I had always in the past gone into that room to see when they had been the mayor and I went in there a couple weeks ago and I went, oh my god, they're gone. And I had never known, and they've been gone for a couple years. But I hadn't noticed it because I hadn't had the need to go see when they were mayor. Um, but we found them, so it's that at least it's because it, it's part of the history of the town. Well, maybe there need, needs to be some program that isn't necessarily a day that's identified, but maybe a recognition and that we have to go back a little bit to see. I mean, I'm just talking out loud now, but there are, because I'm thinking of the wall of women in Lake County commission chambers. Mm -hmm. and, it doesn't, I'm, and I'm not saying for women, but I'm just saying maybe citizens of Mount Dora that made an impact from the time, you know, um, um, that we were incorporated until now. I mean, you know, again, so, but we'll go ahead, we'll start out with looking at what other people policy. have out there policy for a policy. That, that small, smaller towns have developed that honor either people or objects. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the flags are objects, right? Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. We'll do. Is that good? That's good. <clears throat> Okay. Two weeks ish, we'll bring, send you an email and put on. Don't cut yourself. Have problems with this. We'll button. give you an update in two weeks. In two, yeah, I was going to say, don't cut yourself because there's a lot of stuff on the thing. So, yes. you know, it's important, but it's not the highest priority, but we need to address it. No disrespect, but. Re, re, realistic time frame. Okay. Community wide cleanup days. This is yours. Right. Oh, it's yours too. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, Ms. Burnett, tell us about community wide cleanup day. Well, I know that the Northeast is, has a cleanup day. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, so when I went to Rwanda, they have an they have a cleanup day every month. Every month, the third Saturday of every month. And and the, the, the country is just absolutely pristine. It's beautiful. So I was wondering if we could do that. And maybe in, in my conversation with, with um, the city manager, we talked about having the churches involved and having the not-for-profits involved. And perhaps that's what we will do. But I don't know when we could do this, and I don't know who should do it. I do know that the city staff is pressed and they do have to be paid. And so perhaps we could discuss when and where and how and who should do it. So I believe um, Councilmember Stile reached out to me. We spoke about a organization, I believe it was a a uh, religious organization that was willing to pick up along 441 and uh, any other place if we just reached out to them. Um, that's when I mentioned that maybe we need to send out a, a notice or a request or maybe they would be willing to step up. But also to keep in mind we have several events. So we have the Northeast several times a year, uh, three times a year I believe, Chief Bell, yes, about sir. three times. Um, we have Lake County who also uh, does one in usually March time frame. Um, and then we also have, uh, Tiberius also has a cleanup day and so does Eustace on a regular basis, Eustace does. So some of the cities around us also have cleanup days, <coughs> again, just encouraging their citizens um, to, to provide, you know, to clean up around their area and, and put this in for the uh, data out or the, the trash, I guess, what we'd refer to, um, out. Um, but the other thing we need to do is as we go through something like that, we also need to reach out to waste management um, because we're going to add um, to that pickup, whatever that pickup might be, because I, I would not want 
trash collected to set on the road and then pick up uh, on a Saturday and pick up not until Friday um, or something to that effect mm -hmm. because we see that happen. Um, so I, I think that from a big picture, we, we do have pickup days and I mean we do have beautification days or cleanup days that maybe what we need to do first is put together the calendar of what we know who and what is doing. And, and then we can come back and, and look at that. But I, I do feel like we already have a lot of community involvement in that. And then we can reach out from that point. But here we've just given you one example. But I do know Lake County reaches out to us and others um, for events. And some of the, again, I'll mention some of the um, other organizations that I think do the same thing. Yeah, I was going to say, I think Kiwanis used to do road cleanup days. And Rotary, I think, he does them. And, yes, and do. yes, you do. Here you are. And, and Once I, a quarter. I do. I was involved with the church group also that did it along 441. So there may be more than one out there. And I think the other thing that we did discuss a little bit was just an education of what we have available as to how people can get things picked up. That's right. Because um, you know, a phone call um, or to the website. I believe there's an area on the website you can go out and put in that. Because I, we all drive around town and you see the couch that's been pulled out and it's sitting there two days later. Well, somebody needs to let someone know that the couch is there to be picked up. And a lot of times our residents don't realize you do need to make a phone call. It does eventually get picked up most of the time because somebody sees it enough to do it. But if a phone call was made before the couch went out there, then it would probably be picked up sooner because there is a process in place for that. Or I, I say couch, I've seen all kinds of stuff. And of course, you can't, where's Ivy? I saw her. You can't call Ivy because she makes sure it got to somebody if it was still one, good enough to be used. <laughs> but anyway, um, in recent weeks, we both, I know you and I, and I don't know the rest of you saw several couches and things different. But there is a place where you call. And, and, can, and I, so I think maybe it, it might behoove us to make sure the residents are aware that we have that process in place, too, in addition to checking this out. I would agree. Um, I think, Lisa, can you come up? I think it's a good opportunity for you to come up, Lisa, and just show um, the, the um, cell phone. The, the, the app. app? Yes. Can I, you, I created a video. Can you, can you just show that real quick? I, again, I think this is okay. important because we talked about having the um, to uh, report an incident. So I wanted to make sure that we showed that so that, again, we can make the citizens aware that on their phone, when they're not driving, <laughs> that they, they stop and do this. <laughs> yes. So while um, this is pulling that up, it's in the presentation folder. Um, you can either report a concern through the website or you can do it through your mobile app and it goes to, it, it's called the iPhone app. There I am. Um, so you can do it right there. You can take a picture with your phone and send it to us right away. Uh, and that's 24 7 and it's through the mobile app. It's right there on the app and it's going to explain it right in the video for you. It's a minute 30. So. Okay. But we do have waste management <laughs> phone number on there that to please contact them. But this is our other option. At least this notice goes to Joe and his group, and then they reach out to waste management if our own folks don't pick it up. Because sometimes we do. They, mm -hmm. they go out there very quickly and respond. Okay, Misty. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm working on it. Okay. Okay, there we go. Someone saved change settings on here. Not <laughs>
find something more specific, such as a department or form online. Okay. Staff directory to find someone specific. You can download the app by going to the Apple App Store for iPhone or Google Play for Androids. Search City of Mount Dora eGov and download the app. So, again, so we can try to make it easy, but I think putting together something, a calendar. Okay. So, Ms. Stiles, you're in the middle, so you can go first, and then Mr. Massey, and then Mr. Ross. Uh, so, is this limited to trash pickup? Because I had a resident um, send me an email that, um, I think it was Habitat for Humanity or somewhere, um, gives away paint so that if somebody is either not able to or can't afford to have their home painted that any of these organizations will paint the house or, you know. Joe, the, uh, Waste well, Management, do they pick up any of those things? They don't pick up paint. That's uh, Lake County. Um, yeah. Has will be up. No, sorry. That wasn't my question. I'm sorry. Um, that if somebody cannot because of their physical limitations or age or whatever, can't paint their home, but their home needs, like a Habitat for Humanity builds a home, but somebody needs their home painted or whatever, their window's stuck, or are we limiting this to picking up trash on the road, or is this these volunteer organizations can, hey, I don't mind, because this church group does. They offer, I mean, they paint schools, they paint park benches at schools, um, so they don't just do trash pickup. So is this limited to trash pickup? So my understanding, it was beautification um, to the outside to, to, to clean up our area. I mean, that may be a different program, but I, that was my understanding of the notes initially. It's just looking at the cleanup. And the reference point was the, even the northeast on the cleanup day. Is that correct? Beautification. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mr. Massey? No, I'll pass. Pass, Mr. Ross. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, to summarize what I'm hearing, the first thing we need to decide is uh, if we should do this and how often as a city, if the city is involved in some promotional directional process. Number two, we need to find out from our manager what calendar days are available that's appropriate matching, waste management and so forth as we've talked about. And then we need to thirdly probably develop some process if we're actually involved as a policy of the city. It seems to me that that's something our manager can bring back to us as a recommendation for us to discuss and modify if we're going to do that. I, I think Ms. Burknett has a good idea. The Northeast community does it two or three times a year and the times I haven't done it lately but for obvious reasons but my the uh, uh, Shirley and I have done that often, and it's really a fun thing to do for that those Saturdays or whatever we do. But I've never thought through, and of course the police department was actively involved in collecting the bags and so forth. We developed, I don't know, four or five dozen bags of stuff just in the Northeast community, but I don't know what they what they've done with it. It might not fit with waste management's uh, plan if that's where it's supposed to go. So oh, they've put it in the big dumpster there at the corner. That's where it always went. Okay. So it, waste management ultimately got it. Which is anyway, I like, in the, in the, like the process, but I think there's a lot of tentacles out there that I think are... Yeah. Let, let me suggest that the city manager take what she's heard today and see, because I, I, I think it's a great idea of how to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit in size and pieces, and, and I, I see an opportunity for education of some of the things we already have in place because my concern is creating another program that someone's got to work it and manage it and do it. And, you know, we already, I think, heard tonight, and I'm sure, you know, Ms. Hayes is going to go back and look at uh, purchasing because, um, you know, as things are coming to us, though, seriously, and it's no reflection on anyone, they're coming to us, and if you hear something started back in August and it's finally getting to us in February and it's got to do with the timeliness of, of getting some of our construction stuff uh, done, um, stuff, ugh construction done and we've got all these different projects we're talking about and we seem to be adding more you know how much more can you add to the five pound bag you know we used to talk all the time when I worked in healthcare you, you have a five pound bag and we had ten pounds of sand in it and everybody was the faster they go the behind they got because they were making mistakes because they were doing too much but anyway with that said uh, let's go on to lobbyist update um, so we provided you the two weeks um, I spoke with our lobbyists um, yesterday and today, 
Um, it looks like our EOC for 500000 is still in the appropriations. It's gone on to the next level. Um, and the, um, the uh, Joe had one for utilities. It's still in the mix. So, again, it's made it through another house, another bill, or another uh, piece of the process. So, as it goes through and it's continuing to be pushed forward, that's a, a positive for us. Um, so, again, just good information. Uh, please be aware um, you'll, you receive uh, emails uh, and to reference to speak to writing to our legislative group um, in reference to opposing or promoting a bill. Please make sure that you're um, at least responding to those as best you can. Yes, they are. So, um, and uh, But that's about it on the lobbyists. You'll see this every week, so we'll continue to give you updates. Um, as we go to Tallahassee next week, <coughs> Excuse me. They're in their third week this week, fourth week next week. Uh, bills are um, actually there's a deadline next week while we're up there, so I believe we'll find out a little bit more information at that point in time, and we'll be able to give you a, a different update the following week, uh, the March or the excuse me, I guess it's the 18th, 17th, 18th of February, whatever date that is, 18th, I believe it is. So we'll give you an update at that meeting also. How's John Wayne doing? Um, so he is in rehab for um, speech. Um, he is into his third or fourth week, um, small sentences, um, but he's actively writing when he just can't get it all out, um, but he's doing much better, so prognosis is very good. So, um, And then the next piece of this is city manager discussion, uh, construction update, um, so I'll go forward, so Chet. Quick update tonight. Uh, the one that I will be covering is our. Get to work. Or just push it forward. I got it. If you could just click through it, it's fine. Yeah, I sure can. No problem. <laughs> uh, the one that I'll be updating on is uh, the fire station 35. And then uh, kind of a new segment to this will be uh, updates on our land acquisitions, which Tim will, will cover. So go ahead. Uh, the, the main thing we did the, in the last few weeks here is uh, we, we did perform the environmental remediation, as in uh, I super I was I was present while the, the contractor performed it. Um, that that portion of the project is complete, and they uh, installed a test well. This is for future monitoring, so this will ensure that all the uh, contaminants were can, were removed and and were safe to go. That is a requirement. Uh, one other side of this, uh, during this time, we also, Universal Engineering, performed their lead and asbestos testing of the actual structure. Uh, we're awaiting the official report from that. Uh, the prox, it looks, it, it looks like we're okay. Um, in the meantime, the fire station, you'll see, as Mr. Massey mentioned earlier this evening, um, they are utilizing the structure for training purposes, so we're getting good use of it uh, before the demo takes place. And if there's any questions for me, I have a question. Okay, Tim. Turn over to Tim. So on uh, Fire Station uh, 36, I'll give you a quick update. So we, we've worked with two property owners out at the corner of First Avenue and uh, US 441 for the third station, Fire Station 36. We're working, been working with DOTs, you know, they're doing the 441, 46, so part of the land that they need to transfer to us is involved in that corner. They need to get a survey and then they're gonna transfer the land to us at no cost. So we've been monitoring that, their work, and uh, hope we would hope to have that paperwork by the end of March, beginning of April. Once we have that, then we can bring the whole package to council on the whole assembly of three properties, and then we can then we can do our other due diligence. Really, uh, since these are residential, just for uh, survey, we'll have to do surveys, and then so we can pre proceed pretty quickly at that point once we have the information from DOT. 
So, um, because there are homes on these properties, we will need to consider the other boards that we might need to take, uh, the removal of a home or the transfer of a home or whatever we might propose to council. So, th this particular property could take a little bit more time once uh, it's purchased, if and, and if that is what we proceed with, um, to really get back to you in order to build a station. We are, yes, uh, we are going to have to do uh, rezoning to make it, you know, eligible for public land use property because it is residential uh, today or office on that on that corner so we will have to rezone rezone the properties can you talk about where no it's not where that is in detail yet and what you said first and 441 correct so like i said we have two two properties under okay. agreements yep. You've answered my and we would bring the whole package the two properties we have an agreement with the dot paperwork all at the same time that way we're looking at it once we can see the whole picture and, uh, um, but they're really we'll contingent proceed. on each other, so we really right. need that property there. Right. 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 Okay. right. So you've answered my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome. Um, the parking facilities. I just kind of wanted to go over where we were at because we've had this conversation. We did reach out to the Methodist <laughs> Church. Um, so I don't know. So we lost that, ladies. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we were done, Misty. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Um, so we've reached out to the church. Um, um, unfortunately, uh, this week, this particular week, they have, um, uh, Pastor Gary has the flu, um, so he was not able to give us um, an update on their strategic plan. If you recall, they actually are looking to also do a, a strategic plan for the church. Um, so, uh, but I want to mention up there because he's been very uh, diligent in speaking with us and very upfront with us and that we'll still continue to look at that property. Um, but, um, you know, he also needs an update from, from the city on our strategic plan. It's just a timing right now, the last couple of weeks because of the illness in the, um, in the parish. So, um, the city's also investigating a parcel that's not in the immediate downtown. Um, so, um, just having a reasonable walking distance between the downtown area and a parking facility, what would be the council's first thoughts? Um, and I think it's something you need to think about if it's not in the downtown. Um, you know, um, we are um, uh, actually taking a, a road trip over to St. Augustine. Um, I think the distance between their parking garage and the downtown, it's X, whatever that might be. Um, they have a trolley system that's operated um, by a private business, but they also have city that operates for events. Again, we want to bring that back to you to give you a reference point before you make a decision going forward. Um, and just kind of plays into that distance perspective. And then parking facility discussion um, during strategic plan, it was briefly brought up. The fact that we might want to bring that back up or we'll bring that back up during the, um, this, the, the, December, the March 6th, excuse me, um, yes, as a discussion item um, and pick that up and go forward with it. But we hope to have a little bit more information by that March 6th meeting. I will add this item to the March 4th meeting but I'll defer it to the March 6th. But we want to keep it on rotation of the first meeting of each month to talk about the parking. So um, that's where we're at. Um, and um, again, we're still looking at um, uh, vacant parcels, but even parcels that have a facility or building on them. Um, if they're not being utilized, are they willing to sell them? Or is it a, is a, a remodel or a relook at that property? So again, to our redevelopment that we already do. So. And that's all we have on the parking at this point. Thank you. Um, so, and yes, thank you. The Hydro Corp letter. Um, oh, sorry, I thought there was going to be a questions screen. Um, there it is. Thank you, Misty. Um, the dumpster, the compactors out at the 5th um, the and Baker by the Fiesta Grande restaurant, um, somebody mentioned to me that there's been a black tar dumped in front of the compactors that now forms a huge puddle every time it rains which you have to walk through to throw your trash away so was there a reason for the black tar I'm sure there was yes yeah, so that was an asphalt patch that was actually performed uh, by public works and that was a, in a, our efforts that we had mentioned in the past few updates to work with waste management um, that was the, the cheapest route to go, the most cost effective, I should say. Um, that still did not solve our problem of the, the truck approaching the compactor. So uh, last week, city staff, city engineering, and myself actually performed a survey of the, uh, the grade, the elevation change in the lot, which is causing our problem. And um, our 
in-house engineers have put together a, a drawing, which we are now um, reviewing with contractors to come up with a cost of what it would would take to fix that. So our goal is to uh, to not only fix the, the problem that we have today, but ultimately there's a, a, a needed option of a third compactor in that specific area due to the high high uh, turnover of trash so or waste and um, so we're working to solve today's problem and and the problem we'd have in the future too just to take the, the the large approach to it so so I think if you look at half the parking lot down toward where the dumpsters are we would have to change the grade from that point mm -hmm. uh, down to the Kirby um, in, of the exit area of the parking lot which again solves a little bit of our um, streetscape problem um, because we would have to clean up the walkway um, and that curving area and we, we talked about cleaning all that up at that point in time as best we can um, on, a, on a smaller value versus a complete streetscape. So, so that will be removed in the future. Okay, and the, the old dumpsters are still out there just because of the sheer volume? Correct. Or just because uh, the compactor is not? The one compactor is not operational, so those are in place um, to handle the load gotcha. right now. Okay, thanks. No other questions, right? Okay, sorry. Um, okay, the HydroCorp letter. So um, we have, um, so Mary has a letter here. Um, for each of you to review. Um, HydroCorp, um, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, um, they send out a series of letters, really to the tune of about six letters. Um, this letter is to, uh, at the end of the day, to notify them that they have a new established deadline of 3 16 2020. Um, and it kind of goes through the why and, and, and where and so forth of, as to why we're sending this letter. I just really thought that it would be good for you to review it. Let me know if you have any comments, if you can. Um, we've tried to soften it, but um, we've also tried to explain why they're receiving the letter. We had, uh, I think at one point, softened it to where maybe we had not explained why they were receiving the letter, so we've changed that. Um, and um, I would say this, we were about 70, I think Joe told me, 70 to 80 percent compliant. Um, or at least people, uh, commercial businesses have submitted a plan. Is that correct, Joe? That was early numbers. It's much higher than that. I did not get the update for this meeting, but it's it's probably in the 90 or, or higher numbers from the, what the, for compliance. Everyone's gotten back with mo most of the vendors. Some of the ones that haven't, the businesses are either non-business been sold or there's a change. Um, it's kind of the difficulty at this time. We've had really good compliance and everyone um, has, that once we've explained the program has really come around and supporting us. So if you'll just reach out to me tomorrow. So if we're at 90% now, do we even need to send another letter? Might legally be not I think we either. Is it? Yes. Is there a legal requirement to send a letter out? In, in our plan that we submit as a DEP that was oh, okay. accepted That's in fine. our ordinance, we have a three-phase um, in, in basically implementation. We send them a 30-day notice the first time. We don't get a positive response. We give them a second 30-day notice. Then they get a third one that says That's fine. if you don't. We're good. Um, sure. By compliance, do we mean that the, the Either property owner or business has said, "I will have these installed by this date," or because I know there's uh, there's not 90 percent of these assemblies downtown. I know that they have a plan in place to okay. put one in. Okay, thanks. And they, they gave a date as part of that commitment. So then that's the next set of letters right. is that you committed to a date, you committed to a time. Now you did not meet that. So now this is our next stage. So again, um, if you have comments, if you feel there's anything uh, stated in here that is um, needs to be reconsidered, please reach out to me. If you can tomorrow, I would appreciate it. Or reach out, I'm okay if you reach out to Joe. Um, also, uh, we just like to get the letter through HydroCorp out to, the, to those who need to be notified. So. And I think, Mayor, that is all I have on uh, my city manager's report. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, we have some board appointments.
an outdoor firefighters pension board appointment? Yes. So um, you have Michael Garcia who is serving. Um, he was really requested to, to step on mid uh, June time frame. Um, he has stepped on and um, you know accepted the challenge, so to speak. But he's also willing to go forth and uh, be a member of the pension board. We just would ask that you approve. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Oh, got a low battery here. Goes to sucker down. And then the advisory board. We also have our. Um, I think uh, Ms. Burnett has her alternate position. I do. I didn't know I was supposed to do this yet. <laughs> I have Misty Mahone. Misty Mahone. Mahoy, okay. Thank you. Misty Mahone. Okay. Second. Ms. Stiles approves. Mr. Olson seconds. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, City Attorney's Report. The only item that I have under the report is, um, and you all will start to see some of these. Um, and so we may structure it to where it's, it's just a reporting to you and it's not specifically something that I'm going to speak to you about unless you have questions when you see it. This particular item that is before you is to place you on notice that an amendment's been signed and reviewed to a uh, loan agreement that you all had approved previously based on resolution 2017-150. You provide the city manager with authorization to sign immaterial amendments like this that aren't going to make a change that affects the, the dollar value or those kind of things. So you'll start to see those um, and we'll call them out to where it's just for informational purposes um, just so we can have a better record keeping of them passing through and, and us knowing where they they are and, the, and letting you all know that they have it signed. So that's all I have for tonight. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, communications to report. Mr. Olson. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, the uh, Lake League of Cities has a board of directors um, under their bylaws, and the board consists of one representative from each of the 14 cities and one alternate. Uh, regarding Mount Dora, I'm, because I'm the new president of the Lake League of Cities, I'm that person. But we don't have an alternate. I'd like to at least recommend a consensus of this council that uh, Mr. Massey be a, be approved for that appointment as an alternate, if he agrees to do so as an alternate. I would agree with him a regular attendee. He's a regular, yeah. He's a regular guy. Everybody in agreement? Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I. You may have seen in some emails that uh, uh, Gary Cooney, our Lake County uh, Clerk of Court, and Christy uh, Mullane, I think her name is, for each, uh, they each received, she's the CFO for Lake County, and received some significant uh, Government Finance Officers Association for the U.S. and Canada awards. And uh, I think it would be nice if the council maybe the mayor considered some letter or congratulatory thing to them. It's a, it seems like a pretty high honor, and they're certainly respected members of Lake County that we deal with regularly in one way or another. So uh, I was interested in that. I sent them my own little congratulations. Yeah, I did too, but I would do it for the city. I think yes. the council ought to recognize that too, if you, if you agree. Um, Congratulations, as we all know, that we will come up later to the uh, um, Lake Teacher of the Year that comes from Triangle. Uh, that's another thing we could consider doing uh, as a council. Uh, that's a high honor for a Mount Dora uh, school and uh, was nice. Uh, another, also, uh, congratulations to that robotics team. Uh, another high honor for our middle school in Mount Dora. So we're, the education part is going really high high gear here um, so I, I wanted to offer my suggestion that we do that uh, and uh, I was glad to see here today uh, though I don't there may be others here that I don't see or recognize but we had uh, seemingly many uh, 
residents and other interested persons in the Northeast community attend our meeting today. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not saying I've nagged them, but I'd really I'd like to see their presence here, and I've suggested whenever they can that representatives of, uh, and homeowners in that area show up and, and provide input uh, to our decision making here. So uh, other than that, uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Tucker. Uh, I've got one thing, and I want to thank everybody for being here tonight, is uh, on Valentine's Day, the 14th, the Mount Florida Library Association is sponsoring a Beatles tribute show at the community building next door. All the money will go to the library. And uh, so if anybody has no plans for Valentine's Day on the 14th, saunter over and listen to a couple of Beatles tunes. <laughs> Have a libation. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Dow. Uh, I also just wanted to congratulate the robotics team. That's that's um, a pretty high honor that all three of their teams is going to the the states. Um, and then the only other thing is uh, this Saturday, the eighth, is the uh, African American Heritage uh, Parade and Festival. Um, it's 10 a.m. is the parade. Uh, and 11 a.m. at Collie Lot Park starts all the, the festivities, So, which is also doubled with our Parks and Recreation Department with um, GAI out there to take input for uh, the improvements to Collie Lot Park. So it's very important that everybody attend and, and let them know what, what we're looking for in Collie Lot. And I think that's it for me. Okay, thank you. Ms. Burnett. So, I received this note from um, Nancy Colscar, and yes. it's about the robotics team. Yes. And so she says that, uh, they, that there are three teams, mm -hmm. Ondor Middle School, mm -hmm. and the the competition is going to be held on February 16th in Lakeland. So we need to. I think we could honor them after that. So there, um, the mayor asked me to add them to the agenda, So, as well as the Teacher of the Year. We've added them to, the, I think, the March 17th to allow all the events to transpire, and we'll reach out to the teacher um, and to the team respect, uh, representatives and ask that they can attend for that presentation. Thank you. So I think and, we did that and yesterday. And one more thing. Yeah, one more thing. Yes, ma'am. So um, Montdora Library has the dinosaurs. On yes. display, wonderful, and they are wonderful. So, and they're through the month of February. So, if you have not been to the Mount Dora Public Library and you could see the dinosaurs, that's all. Okay, Vice Mayor, Vice Mayor Massey. I uh, thought I was the only one who got the letter from Nancy, but, <laughs> so I replied to it. <laughs> and I didn't reply all because I don't want to get into trouble. But I did send copies to uh, to City Manager and the Mayor. Uh, and I promised her I'd mention the uh, the activity uh, at tonight's comments, and we would look for a way to bring them back to recognize them after the uh, after the event, uh, their competition. I think that's wonderful. I'm sorry that the gentleman who was here earlier didn't stay to understand that we do support our students, and yeah, uh, right. we think that's very important. This afternoon, as I was driving back from uh, a rotary luncheon, uh, engine 35, uh, station 35 company was out. Uh, perusing their new digs, uh, and I visited with them for a time. They're excited about uh, helping with the demolition out there. They can get some good and valuable training out of that. Uh, they told me what good judgment we have in locating the fire station there because they pointed out all the wonderful places where they <laughs> could go and eat. <laughs> They're so tired of being the tail end of that road out there, they'll be one happy camper when they get over there. It, it's very nice. They're, they're very excited about it. Thank you all. Okay. And another thing to put on your calendars, and I think you all got the notice, but in case you did, on Saturday, February 22nd, um, AMBA, the Ocala Bike, Mountain Bike Association, is doing a 10-year celebration, which is down near Flores Park. I'm not sure where they'll set up, but we'll know. But anyway, that's coming up, so I can't believe it's been 10 years. It's a long time for... Okay, and I'm getting ready to leave for vacation tomorrow at 7.30, and I will be gone until the 16th. And um, I understand that Ms. Style, Mr. Massey, 
is not available. Who's going to be able to go to the chamber breakfast? That's what I'm still working on here. Okay, so uh, our fire chief will be at the chamber breakfast. He'll represent everyone. So you'll give an update for him, and I'm, we can let Ms. O'Brien know that you're going to be there? Yes. And you don't have to pay for breakfast because I've already paid for the year. Um, and we will have Ms. Burnett, uh, uh, Mr. Walson, Mr. Uh, Massey, and Mr. Tucker all attending Tallahassee. Uh, Lake League Day right. get next Tuesday and Wednesday, so that's where they'll be. The style is in Lake Leadership. So, She's in leadership. Uh, and then okay. um, Council Member Crail will not be back until approximately the same time you are returning. Right, and then you're doing the Greenways thing yes. at the Lakeside Inn. Good morning, good night. <laughs> Covered. So, I do believe we have the, um, so I'll just mention the Jane Austen. I think that's coming up. Jane Austen, yes, it is. It's on the, um, yes. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Right. Um, and this weekend? This weekend. Yeah, this weekend. So that's coming up also. And we had a, a really great art show, even though it rained on Saturday. It was a little cool and everything, but um, it picked up in the afternoon. And then I understand many of the store, stores had blowout days on Sunday compared to the Sunday a year ago, of comparing Sundays to Sundays. which So that made it made them happier, considering, and I understand most of the artists, artists did fairly well. I haven't got numbers yet, but I, I have heard that, so that's Your good. food pantry cashed in a little bit, too. Oh, okay. Parking. <laughs> oh, okay. Parking. parking. Okay. I'm sure a lot of you, yeah, parking, it's amazing. Yes, we all did it. Our, our condo association parks cars, too. I thought it was going to be puny, but it turned out to be over $2,000, so they were moving them in and out, so I think everybody does well with parking. Anyone else have anything for the good of the order here? And I'm ready to get out of here. Adjourn.